Chapter 641, Confession Translator, Henyi Translations Editor, Henyi Translations Ji Yushenwei felt that the time to strike had not yet come but he was still ready to unsheathe his sword. The one who revealed the whereabouts of Han Wuxian was Guan Shong. Lotus stared at the Dragon King, measuring the credibility of Ji Yushenwei's words in her heart. Guan Shong used to be a spy planted in Golden Rock Castle by the waning Moon Hall and was a genuine senior disciple who was more loyal to the original Hall leader than her. She had tried to assassinate the Master Commander in the Kingdom of Xiaoyao Lake but ended up dying at the hands of the Dragon King in the end. From beginning to end, Lotus could see no sign that Guan Shong had ever revealed the secret. When we were still in Jade City, Guan Shong felt that she could use me against you so she told me where Han Wuxian was. I refused to help her, but I did send someone to keep looking for Han Wuxian in the desert until I finally found her. Lotus stayed silent. No one knew the Dragon King better than she did. At this moment, she could almost feel every tiny thought that ran through the man's head. Guan Shong could have taken the chance to sow discord but she hadn't mentioned it before she died. Thinking of this, Lotus made up her mind. Han Fen felt a bit regretful because she had a small crush on Chu Nanping, but killing the person that one loved was precisely the standard training method of the waning moon hall. Little girl, why haven't you done it yet? Chu Nanping did not draw his sword or evade. His eyes had always been locked on Tai Ling Long, except for when he had turned to the Dragon King once, hinting to the other side to not interfere. You don't have to be a disciple of the waning moon hall and also don't have to take orders from anyone. The boy's voice was gentle and seemed to have changed into a completely different person who made Ji Yushenwei felt somewhat strange. You don't understand. Tai Ling Long appeared quite restless. She hadn't found Han Xian. Thus, Tai Ling Long thought that Han Wuxian's daughter must be in Lotus's hands though she hadn't shown up yet. She cared a lot about her promise to Han Wuxian, not just for the training method of the seventh level of the Juyin finger energy, but also to fulfill a seemingly sacred mission. Although they had only met twice, that tall, beautiful and motherly woman had firmly taken hold of a corner in Tai Ling Long's heart. She had to help the mother and daughter meet each other. Tai Ling Long almost took this matter as if it were her own reunion with her deceased mother. Chu Nanping didn't understand her plan but he understood very well that this teenage girl was not fit to be a killer, let alone a disciple of the waning moon hall. Her heart hadn't yet been destroyed, and his job was to extricate her from the shadows. All of a sudden, what Tai Linglong was proving was not her loyalty but rather how effective the waning moon hall's training actually was. Lotus spoke. She had thought it all through and what she said was almost a replica of the Dragon King's plan. You put a tail on Tai Linglong and you knew that I would take her and so you deliberately drove her away. You had fooled everyone, I didn't even think of checking the tail behind her. Tai Linglong turned to the Dragon King, her eyes full of surprise and perplexion. Ji Yu Shenwei nodded and admitted, yes, someone followed her and found the headquarters of the Waning Moon Hall in the desert and then spent another year uncovering Han Wuxian's whereabouts. So you've hidden such an expert all this time. Lotus knew all the Dragon King's men and did not remember anyone who had suddenly disappeared for more than a year. Not one, but five. They are not Kung Fu experts but they performed very well under Xu Xiaoyi. They are especially good at long-distance tracking and are indeed experts in this area. Lotus hummed. She had never taken Xu Xiaoyi seriously and never thought that he had people this capable under him. What had happened next was clear. The five trackers had done their duty. They did not dare to get too close to the waning moon hall's headquarters, so they had conducted a slow search around it. Thus, it had taken them a year to find Han Wuxian, who had been actually run into Tai Linglong who had been three days into her escapade. The news was immediately sent back to Xiaoyao Lake. While Ji Yushenwei was on his way to the Norland, another team had set out to rescue the hall leader of the waning moon hall. 
Lotus smiled and looked very happy as she stated, You never trusted me. I don't trust anyone. We are the same. When they were at Xiaoyao Lake, Lotus was secretly giving orders to the disciples of the waning moon hall while Ji Yushan Wei was also quietly working on his own plan. The two of them could entrust their backs to each other but there was not much trust between them and each of them had something of the other sides. Becoming the one in ultimate control was something that Ji Yushan Wei persevered to be in his lifetime and was also the greatest goal of Lotus. Look, this is the Dragon King. Lotus wasn't annoyed, she was merely pointing out the facts to Tai Ling Long. He will try to take advantage of everything, even your own feelings. Well, I don't blame you for not knowing it, but you have to make a choice between following the Dragon King and waiting to be used again or becoming a real disciple of the Waning Moon Hall. This ultimatum was how she would deal with Chu Nanping. Tai Ling Long's mind was in chaos. The awe she held towards Lotus, the commitment to Han Wuxian, and her obsession with of the Dragon King were all strung together and fighting each other to the death, each trying to gain absolute superiority. You've been tricked by the secret arts of the waning moon hall, Ji Yushan Wei reminded though he didn't try justifying his using her. Tai Linglong had followed him for several years and should understand the truth that he used all means, regardless of right or wrong, to strike the enemy. Tai Linglong could only keep a secret when she was unaware of it which was also a form of protection for her. Ji Yushan Wei had confidence in his status in the little girl's mind and therefore knew that her restlessness must be the product of some secret arts. Lotus's eyes twitched a bit and seemed to have realized something. Instead of reaching out for his sword, Chu Nanping stretched out his hands and kept them far away from the sword hilt. He had never thought that he would say this in public, but the words had suddenly risen in his mind and they were so powerful that they broke through the hard shell of the emotionless swordsmanship. The boy had no choice but to submit to it. Come with me. There'll be no dragon king and lotus, just the two of us. I think I'm in love with you. Silence fell upon the tent. Ji Yushan Wei and Lotus didn't expect the young swordsman who always regarded himself as emotionless to say such words. Chu Nanping had shown great concern for Tai Linglong, but Ji Yushan Wei thought that it might take the boy at least ten years to break the barrier in the heart. Han Fen was so excited that she almost burst into tears as if the person accepting the love confession was herself. Kill him, muttered Han Fen. For her, such a beautiful scene was the perfect time to pursue the great Tao of the waning moon hall. Tai Linglong was caught unprepared. This wasn't what she had expected and was also quite out of the place given the current situation. During her time at the headquarters of the Waning Moon Hall, she had refused to accept the training of seducing a man with her body and instead developed an instinctive aversion to men. The Dragon King and Chu Nanping had no gender in her mind, so the confession immediately transformed the teenager into a stranger in her eyes. You. Nonsense, she took a step back her voice trembling. I'm not talking nonsense. You're not fit to be a killer. Let's leave this world. It was exactly these words that struck the sore spot of Tai Ling Long. She had heard something similar from the Dragon King on the first day he had taught her sabersmanship. And this was also not the first time that Chu Nanping had pointed it out, but this time it made her particularly angry. I am a killer. The dagger thrust into the teenager's chest. The Rayal killers had retreated to a safe distance but Tai Linglong could not move. Her wrist was grasped tightly by Chu Nanping, who not only didn't pull out the dagger but helped her add more strength. And he looked neither angry nor sad, only having a smile of relief as if to say, I was right, you don't like killing at all. Tai Linglong became angrier. Lotus's voice suddenly prevailed in her heart and the little girl's killing intent was aroused. But the reaction of her arm and her body was totally different. She couldn't exert any strength at all. The moment Tai Linglong had produced a dagger, Ji Yushan Wei almost drew his sword but he stopped when Chu Nanping refused to dodge and held onto Tai Linglong's wrist. 
The teenage duo was going through the most important choices in their lives. He didn't want to interfere, and neither did he want to ruin it. Even if the two really wanted to leave, he would never stop them. He had used them but he didn't feel ashamed because he had never forced them to do anything even while practicing martial arts. He had simply passed on to them the skills and left them by themselves to figure it out. Lotus made her move, as nimble as she always was. Ji Yu Shenwei drew his dragon head sword at the same time. After the long wait for this moment, what he struck out with was a simple sword move. Ji Yu Shenwei drew his sword but didn't use the Death Sutra sword technique because he felt that Lotus had no killing intent. Lotus easily avoided the Dragon King's attack and pushed the two teenagers away, her voice unprecedentedly harsh. You're no longer a disciple of the Waning Moon Hall, and I forbid you two from following the Dragon King from now on. Get lost. Tai Linglong's face was almost transparently pale as if she had just woken up from a nightmare. Han Wuxian's image blurred and even Lotus's voice turned vague, her anger like rain falling on a land dying of drought, quickly sinking down and disappearing. I... I won't follow anyone anymore, Tai Linglong said defiantly like a child with tears coursing down her cheeks. And she was a child, a child who thought she could wear a killer's mask. Lotus suddenly turned around and left the tent. When she reached the door, she put on her mask in such a hurry that it seemed there was something unbearable here to the point she had to stay as far away as possible. Chu Nanping covered the wound with one hand and held out the other as he said, let's go. Tai Linglong began crying even harder. Who told you to say such nonsense? And in front of so many people. Chu Nanping looked around and thought that there were actually not that many people present, but he didn't argue because Tai Linglong had come over, covered his wound with a silk handkerchief, and then immediately retreated three steps. The two looked at the Dragon King. Go. That was the only word Ji Yu Shenwei said to them. To Tai Linglong, such a farewell was too simple. With tears on her cheeks, she revealed a smile. No one can force me to do anything. I'll go but I may come back in the future. She also had her own secret. She had only reached the second level of the Juyin finger energy so far but sooner or later, she would surprise everyone. As the two started walking outside, Tai Linglong suddenly turned around and said, Han Xian is Han Wuxian's daughter. The hall leader really misses her. The Dragon King nodded to show that he understood. Disappointed and confused, Han Fen didn't understand why the little girl had missed such a good opportunity and also didn't understand the Master Commander's abnormal behavior. Frowning, she thought for a long while before she could understand the reason a little. Han Fen came over and grabbed the Dragon King's arm, her face full of excitement as if they were still friends instead of rivals. Then she lowered her voice with great difficulty and said, The master commander is waiting for you to marry her. You become her man and she your woman, and then all problems will be solved. Ji Yu Shenwei froze. So this was what Han Fen had been trying to say to him. Chapter 642 King Kuari Translator, Henyi Translations Editor, Henyi Translations King Kuari had no counsellors. Looking at the silent and frightened general and servants, he suddenly sighed with emotion. He thought that he had seen everything clearly, but he was still defeated by the Vulgarians. The Vulgarians were the people in front of him, who seemed loyal and willing to risk any danger to do their duty, but were utterly useless at the critical moment. Tell me what's happening out there. Yes, replied the general, as he trembled with perspiration and poured out the hard-won words. Our army is tenaciously defending the eastern part of the nobles' area and we also have five strongholds in the craftsmen area. We can still hold on for the time being. King Rhys who is like a spent arrow now and there's no need to worry about him, but. Why didn't you just say but right away? King Kuari said in a slow and soft tone, like a parent who was patiently educating his child in the simplest truths. Defend, defend, defend. 
Have we hit a dead end already? The general was terrified, and more sweat beaded on his forehead. It was midsummer and the nights were no longer cool, let alone the fact that he was in full armor. Please forgive me, my lord. Our army can still attack but a few traitors are watching from the sides. I'm afraid. How many? Four. Five. King Shinri, King Nari, King Riying, King Riming, and King Rishin. Our connection with the craftsmen area was cut off by them. Have the five kings brought their armies together? No, no, they shouldn't have. Then should I believe you or not? King Kuari's tone was as patient as an old woman's but the general grew more and more uneasy. He lifted his hand to wipe away the waterfall-like sweat trailing down his face and firmly said, The five kings are not yet allied. They are afraid of each other and haven't exerted all their strength. King Shinri smashed the table suddenly and with a harsh tone, which shocked all the people in the tent, said, The five kings would have seized the throne long ago and wouldn't have waited until now if they were willing to ally with one another. It's very simple. The opportunity to make a large contribution is right under your nose but you guys don't want to seize it. Instead, you are talking about so-called defensiveness. There's no such thing as being defensive for tonight's battle. Being defensive means admitting failure and being destroyed. Defeat King Rizhu and the other kings will naturally lower their heads. Being defensive will only encourage coward like King Shinri to be bold. Go attack. Now. Yes. The general hastened to follow the order. I'll issue an order and send 8,000 cavalry straight at the camp of King Rizhu. 8,000? I thought we had 15,000 cavalry units. There were some casualties, and there are 13,000 left. Hem. The general was stunned for a while and then waveringly asked, all out attack. Is there a problem? But, seeing the king's stern eyes, the general swallowed his words. Order King Riao to send at least half of his army. Yes, the general reluctantly replied, wondering whether the king's only ally would accept the order or not. The general retreated from the tent and climbed onto the horse with the help of his entourage. The cool breeze came and carried away the nervousness in his heart and all the submissiveness in his face. Stay here all of you. Do whatever you can to protect the Lord. If anything happens to the Lord, neither you nor I will not live. King Kuari couldn't see the loyalty shown by the general but only felt that there was a lack of available talented people under his command, especially when he was full of emotion and there was no one he could talk to. He waved for everyone in the tent to withdraw, leaving only one guest. The guest looked ordinary and stood in the last row hardly attracting any attention. He was a golden rock killer. The dragon king didn't come, and neither did the cloud king, King Kuari said flatly, trying to tamp down the discontent in his heart. Strictly speaking, the golden rock castle killer was not yet his subordinate. The killer appeared much calmer than the general. The dragon king has already set out from the camp. He's just waiting for the right moment. A killer always acts when the target thinks it's impossible for him to make a move. As for the Cloud King, he is more patient because he's the master of the killer. King Kuari appreciated the killer's way of speaking who was always confident even though nothing had been done yet. So he smiled and nodded slightly. What's your name? Killers don't have names. Good habit. How long have you been a killer for? Fourteen years. Fourteen years? You don't look that old. I received the title of killer when I was nineteen. King Kuari stayed silent for a while before he suddenly asked, Do you think I will win? Your Highness will become the Lord of the Royal Court before dawn. Ha ha, I didn't know that the killer's kung fu of flattery wasn't weak either. Can you beat the Dragon King? The killer hesitated for a moment before replying, a killer doesn't say beat or defeat dot. Oh, what do you say then? Who can kill who? 
What's the difference? When we say beat or defeat, we are comparing kung fu skills, but when it comes to kill or can't kill, we are comparing methods, all kinds of methods, of which kung fu is just one. King Kuari seemed to understand a bit. For example, if I don't know kung fu, I naturally can't beat you. But if I can kill you by poisoning, then I'm a good killer. Exactly. The herald rushed in, his face beaming, my lord, our army has stormed the office of King Rizhu and will end the battle soon. King Kuari felt refreshed by the news but didn't show it on his face. Any reactions from the other kings? The four lords are holding their troops still. King Shengri has advanced forward one mile and is within a bowshot's distance from us now. The bird king has some nerve. Go order King Riyao to wave him into flight. The herald left with the orders. King Kuari thought for a long while with his chin resting on his fist before he took a glance at the killer, seemingly surprised that the other side was still standing there. I'm really curious. The Dragon King is a traitor to Golden Rock Castle, but why hasn't the unique king killed him? Yang Huan is lucky. He's been lucky for several years in a row. Some people have better luck, and the King Lord has never sent out his strongest killers. Ha ha. King Kuari was in a good mood, so he was willing to chat and pass the time. The unique king underestimated Yang Huan. He made a mistake, thinking that Yang Huan was an insignificant figure and that he could get rid of him at any time so he was never in a hurry. To his surprise, the Dragon King grew strong and even defeated his army. Now it is too late. The killer kept silent with his head lowered. Does it upset you that I belittled your king lord, asked King Kuari coldly. He wasn't used to people turning a cold shoulder to him. The lowly me dares not to. I'm not qualified to participate in such things so I don't dare to comment on it. He, not only are you a good killer but you are also a good servant. Let me tell you something, the rules of war are the opposite of the killer's rule. You have to defeat your enemy. Killing is not the purpose but the process. Sometimes war won't end even if you kill the commander. With all due respect, I know nothing about war. The killer appeared even more humble. King Kuari hadn't fully expressed his views yet, but he didn't want to talk about his thoughts with a stiff killer anymore as it was tantamount to showing off pearls before swine. But the silence was really distasteful and he didn't want to harp on about it in front of his servants and subordinates so he asked, how are you going to kill the dragon king when he comes? Ah. The killer felt a bit reluctant to reveal the assassination plan because it didn't conform with Golden Rock Castle's rules. But he gave up his reservations on second thought. This was the future Khan of the Norland, and even the unique king would have to lower his head in front of this man here not to mention himself. The Dragon King won't bring too many helpers with him, maybe two or three people. They will circle around your highness's tent, find the hidden killers, remove a few of them, and secure a safe retreat route. Then they'll sneak into the tent and launch a deadly blow. They'll retreat immediately after that no matter if it's successful or not. That sounds like a good plan. This tent is the most heavily guarded place right now. There are killers acting as guards on all sides. If the Dragon King takes a risk, he will fall into a siege before he can approach your highness. If he gives up the plan at the last moment and retreats from the route is arranged, he'll also fall into a trap. That's our plan. King Kuari looked around as if he wanted to find a trace of those invisible guards. I'd rather take the Dragon King alive. We'll try but the Dragon King is very dangerous. I'm just saying that. I'm fine with the head as well. The Herald ran in for the second time but this time there was no gleam of joy on his face. Our army is surrounded at the camp of King Rizhu, and the two sides are fiercely fighting. King Kuari still kept his composure but his interest in the Dragon King and the killer had vanished. Move King Riao's whole army to the rescue. King Riao is currently confronting King Shengri. Never mind King Shengri, 
just go pass my orders. The Herald left in a hurry, not daring to say another word. That's war, a mixture of truths and falsehoods. King Shengri said to the killer, King Shengri is a coward who drinks wine and keeps birds. He won't actually dare to make a move if King Riao's army retreats. That's a smart move. I admire your highness's wisdom. He, so if you wanted to scare the dragon king away, why not remove the guards around the tent and set traps on his way out? Well, your highness's safety is more important than anything else. Again, I'm just saying it. It's up to you to how to get rid of a killer. Another herald ran in, puzzled. King Shengri has come to see my lord. King Kuari snorted. The old bird king is indeed the first to get cold feet. The killer took a step forward and cautioned, be careful of a catch, your highness. King Kuari shot a stern glance at the killer, very dissatisfied with his transgression. A killer should not speak up without permission, let alone meddle with a collaboration between the lords. The killer understood the king's meaning so he anxiously knelt on one knee and explained, Yang Huan may take the opportunity to sneak in. How many men did King Shengri bring with him? asked King Kuari. A dozen or so guards, less than twenty. Keep the guards outside the camp, let him come in alone. Yes. The killer returned to his original position, maintaining a high level of vigilance in his mind. King Shengri came, and he was sweating profusely. This night seemed particularly hot. Without even noticing the killer in the corner, he walked straight to King Kuari. The killer was relieved to ascertain that this fat old king was definitely not a killer in disguise. My dear nephew, you've really made a scene this time. Oh, really? I don't think it's a big scene. King Shengri looked around and finally noticed the lone killer. Who's this man? Is he trustworthy? Feel free to speak your mind. King Kuari avoided the question. King Shengri coughed twice before saying, The Khan has an order. Yes. It's a secret order and we've all received it. It says that whoever can stop your fight with old CHA will be the heir. King Kuari still contained his composure. He finally understood why several kings who had originally fallen to his side had changed their stances and become neutral in the war. It turned out that they were still thinking of the title of Khan. What are you doing here then? Did you come just to tell me this? I'm here to try to persuade you to call a truce. You want to end the battle without joining it and let the Khan appoint you as his heir. King Kuari felt that his uncle's brain was even more confused than King Dari's. Yes, and when I am the Khan, I'll pardon you an old CHA. You can still keep your title and status but cannot stay in the royal court any longer. Ha! Huh. King Kuari laughed with extreme anger, I'll also give you one condition. Join my group, hand over your title as a king. You can keep yours birds and wine and find a grassland to retire to. Otherwise, I'll share your wine with the soldiers and drink all of them with the roast bird. King Shengri shook his head, Alas, my dear nephew, things are more complicated than you think. Listen, the messenger is coming. I bet it's a crow, a big crow. The crow wasn't alone, but actually a murder, the saying for a group of crows is a murder of crows. Seven or eight soldiers carried a stretcher in, on top of which was the general who was covered with blood and already unable to speak. No one reported the situation of the battlefield. King Kuari stepped down from his seat and walked toward the seriously wounded general. The killer had a sense of crisis from the start but he did not dare to shout out a warning, and all of a sudden, his sense for crisis reached its zenith. Watch. The second word was left unsaid forever, as the dizziness had kicked in at that moment. The killer reached out for his saber hilt but was cut at the heart. The attacker raised her head, it was obviously a woman's face under the helmet. King Kuari stopped and recognized that one of the guards was the dragon king himself. But the dragon king seemed to be a bystander. 
Everyone, including the Dragon King, gave way to a woman who, though dressed in the guard's suit, was not disguised. Who are you? King Kuari was bewildered and surprised by the sudden appearance of the enemy, especially when he saw that even King Shinri was acting deferential to the strange woman. Chapter 643, King Rizhu Translator, Henny Translations Editor, Henny Translations The men were killing each other while the women were secretly taking control of the royal court. Ji Yushan Wei was willing to be an observer and wait for an opportunity, additionally, he was very curious as to how far Lotus could go. There was no need for Lotus to act personally and join in on any assassinations taking place in the royal court, but she had still invited the Dragon King to join her in hopes of convincing this stubborn killer through reality. She believed that the Dragon King belonged to the Dark Knight, the Shadows, and her. Ji Yushan Wei saw that the chaos of the royal court had gradually gone out of control as Lotus had expected. The lords had tried to call for a truce but the messengers they sent were either killed or had disappeared, causing more panic. But Lotus felt that it wasn't enough. She wanted to unleash an inferno of vengeance, regardless of the consequences. Looking at the fallen killer, King Kuari suddenly understood why Golden Rock Castle wasn't able to kill the Dragon King. The killers of the unique king had a deep-rooted preconception that Yang Huan was from the castle so his thinking and behavior must conform to the killer's principles. In fact, from the very day of his defection, the dragon king had already broken past the yoke of the killer. The killer had said that the dragon king would come and so he did. The killer had also said that he would only bring two or three people with him but he had come with seven or eight. The killer had said the assassins would approach in circles but they had simply walked straight in. The killer said the tent was heavily guarded but he had collapsed with none of the hidden guards he mentioned showing up. I'm really stupid. King Kuari blamed himself for the first time in his life in his heart. I knew that we should not have underestimated the Dragon King but I was still influenced by Golden Rock Castle and only treated him as a relatively formidable killer. He leaned over and looked at his general. You've done your best. It's just that you're not that capable. The badly wounded general was full of urgency and shame. Not only had he failed to fulfill the task assigned by the lord but he had also became a tool for the assassins before he died. He wanted to say something but didn't want to waste his energy on words, so he staggered to his feet and spread his arms to protect the lord. No one did anything. The general took a deep breath but wasn't able to breathe out, and then fell to the ground, dead. King Kuari straightened himself and looked at King Shinri, the only person who had a status equal to him in the tent. This is a great empire, and I hope you can live up to its reputation. Think about the lineage of the Khan which has lasted for over 300 years when you bow to an outsider. He turned to the Dragon King next. Loyalty is a good thing but it may not be useful. Now I understand what the Dragon King has done in the western regions. You left your loyalty aside when you sit at the chessboard and you are right to do so. I underestimated you and I apologize for that. If I could do it again, I would choose you as my ally. Ji Yushan Wei nodded slightly. He had seen many scenes of people about to die and King Kuari was undoubtedly the calmest one not debasing his status as a king. Although Ji Yushan Wei still would not choose to ally with him if everything happened all over again, that didn't affect his respect towards this king. King Kuari turned again, this time to to the beautiful but indifferent strange woman. Let me guess, you must be Lotus, the master commander of the waning moon hall. Nobody answered, which meant that his guess was right. Is the Khan dead? Alas, I thought that the waning moon hall hadn't infiltrated the palace. Excuse me, how did I lose? Lotus began to explain, mostly because she wanted to tell the Dragon King. Your herald betrayed you long ago. He never passed any orders to King Riyao. That lord is still waiting for your orders to make a move. The battle situation in the front line wasn't good so your entourage also defected and colluded with the assassins to plot against your general, 
which created the fiasco your army is in. King Kuari nodded, the loyalty earned at one's prime time becomes the price of betrayal when one falls into decline. It's really of little use. But he was still a bit confused and asked, why? I wonder. King Kuari spread his arms and pointed at Lotus and King Shinri, not understanding why a pure-blooded son of the Khan would bow to a woman who was not even a herdsman of the Norland. King Shinri, who was silent and wearing a sympathetic smile on his face, suddenly said, My nephew is very talkative. He can preach about his big ideas for three days and nights, but are we going to wait the whole time? It's okay to wait a little longer. Lotus had no intention of taking King Shinri's request. The Norland holds great power but doesn't have the right person to command it. That's why. King Kuari felt humiliated and then said the last words of his life. Who's going to kill me? A woman with a smile came up to him. King Kuari was affected and habitually smiled back. But he still wanted to protest, hoping the other side could have the Dragon King do it so that his death would be worthy of his identity, but the woman acted faster than he expected. King Shinri's face stiffened. A scion of the Khan, a king, he muttered as if he were the only living person in the tent. There's a saying, the blood of the Khan will never end, a drop of it will always flow and grow into a river dot. That prophecy will come true, said Lotus coldly. She had chosen King Shinri as her temporary puppet because he was the weakest and had no choice but to accept her harsh conditions. Blood will flow over the ground like water soon in the royal court. Will King Riyao avenge King Kuari? Yes. King Shinri came to his senses. This was not the time to feel sad about the loss of his family members. Although King Riyao is an elder, he worshipped this nephew and believed everything he said. Cut off his head and send it to him, and then spread the news that the Dragon King was the assassin. Ji Yushinwei was one step closer to being forced to join the waning moon hall and he began to seriously consider whether to marry Lotus or not. He had been thinking about this matter ever since Han Fen had told him the truth. Lotus obviously hadn't said anything like that. Han Fen's understanding was quite different from others so her words were not often worth believing. But marrying Lotus was indeed a solution. He had married the Princess of the Stone Kingdom for benefits so naturally, he could do it again. If the military counselor were here, he probably would have thought that it was a great idea. Lotus's mind was complex and her feelings towards the Dragon King were particularly complicated. Perhaps even she herself could did not fully understand them. She had concocted a crazy plan to kill most of the men in the world but was slow to take action against the Dragon King. Instead, she had been surprisingly patient in persuading the Dragon King to join the Waning Moon Hall. That did seem like a hint. Ji Yu Shenwei thought calmly. He saw this as a possibility and then classified it as an unlikely backup plans. He was not at the end of his rope and wasn't being forced to do anything. The next one is King Rizhu, Lotus said as if she were an enthusiastic host and were introducing the beautiful scenery of her hometown to the guests. The sky turned bright. King Rizhu poured out a large mouthful of spirits, wiped the sweat on his face, and despised his opponent in his heart. King Riz who really lives up to his title, this boy always indulges in empty talk and does nothing practical. He doesn't even have the guts to go to the battlefield himself. The soldiers all admiringly looked at King Riz who and approvingly laughed. One of the veterans cried out, Our Lord fought with us and is covered with blood. King Kuari sent his general out to fight while he himself is hiding cowardly instead. He's probably covered in tears by now. How can our lord not win? Win. King Rizhu gulped down another bowl of wine and believed that he was worthy of the compliments of his men. The black tower-like general Jesu pushed his way to King Riyao, who didn't look as excited as the ordinary soldiers. My lord, the battle is not over yet. I'm afraid King Riyao will attack soon and the other lords have already begun to seize territory. 
we must find a way to stabilize them. I see. There is a lot to do but I worry about the Dragon King most. That boy has too many wicked ideas, and Wild Horse and Shangguan and you may not be able to keep an eye on him. And your son, King Riz who grew serious. I heard he was kidnapped by the Dragon King's men and taken to the women's camp. Yes. Chasu's black face flushed like a piece of hard iron being heated. King Riz who laughed out loud and patted the general on the shoulder, you're afraid I'll punish Lyman. Don't worry. When the battle is over, he can choose any of the women of the land of fragrance he likes. He can take revenge on whoever bullied him in a bed and he won't be allowed to stop his revenge until he's satisfied. That's my punishment. The soldier's laughter grew louder. My lord, I want to be bullied, too. Everyone will have their chance. King Rhys who stood on the edge of the battlefield and glanced over the corpses and broken flags, his voice loud and clear. The Norland, the Central Plains, the Western Regions, and the land of fragrance. There are many women in the world. Do I still deserve to be King Rizhu if I can't let each of you have at least ten women? The morale of the soldiers immediately rose, and they, who had just finished a battle, were anxious to start the next one. The soldiers all mounted their horses, replenished their arrows, replaced their sharp sabers, roared shrilly and followed their generals across the messy battlefields to kill in the east of the nobles' district. King Rhys whose face fell as he said to Shasu, I can forgive your son. It depends on the contributions you can make to make amends for him. My lord, thank you for having mercy on me. Shasu was about to kneel down when King Rhys who held him up and said, We're brothers, so just cut that out. Never soften your knees on the battlefield. Chasu solemnly nodded, climbed onto the steed, and decided that he had to win the battle for his Lord King Riao even if he had to die today. The cavalry set off one after another, and King Riz who also climbed onto his horse. His body was tired but his heart was full of excitement. The blueprint he had laid out for many years was about to come true. Soon he would no longer be the only foreign king of the Norland. King Rhys who looked northward and slowly took a deep breath as if he could feel the life or death of the Khan by doing this. Dragon King. He muttered the name. From this day on, there was no need to indulge this ungrateful fellow's requests, only hacking this guy into pieces could soothe his anger and save his face. The flame foal is my horse. King Rhys who urged his horse to move forward. Compared to the missing flame foal, this horse was annoyingly slow. Unlike King Kuari who had sat and waited for the results of the battle, he would go to the battlefield and even join it in person when necessary, letting the whole prairie know who the real king was. A small group of cavalry rushed towards the camp, carrying King Rizhu's flag and calling out from a distance, King Kuari has been killed by the dragon king. The guards cheered in unison but King Rizhu was stunned. According to his plan, the Dragon King should have been with Shangguan Enyu and Wild Horse at the palace in the northern area. Was he so efficient that not only had he gotten rid of the Khan but had also killed King Kuari on his way back? Stop them, King Riz who commanded because he didn't know any of the coming horsemen, and he knew his own men very well. Chapter 644, Settling Translator, Henyi Translations Editor, Henyi Translations Looking at King Kuari in the morning sunshine, Lotus said in a low voice, King Kuari would not be his match even if he were still alive. Ji Yushinwei stood beside her, three paces apart, as if they were still close partners. He has fatal flaws too. Hem, he trusts his men too much and thought that none of them would betray him. Standing behind the two, Hen Fen stared at their backs and felt that they were a perfect match and couldn't help but wear a happy smile on her face. As Ji Yushinwei quietly appreciated the assassination that Lotus had planned, he gradually began competing with her in his mind, secretly thinking about how he would have gotten rid of King Rizhu if he were Lotus. As soon as the small group of horsemen was recognized, they immediately turned their horses around and fled northward. 
More than a hundred men of King Rishu followed closely behind, while another hundred men turned southwest, ready to intercept any assassins. It was like hunting. Ji Yushan Wei thought of what Du Guzian said about the Norland cavalry and realized that he was right. The fighting style of the Norland army had evolved entirely from their hunting tactics and required little command. Everyone knew their own position and role. The tents were like dense trees, and the horsemen of King Rizhu were obviously more familiar with the terrain, as they galloped back not long after leaving. It's Golden Rock Castle, they were all killed. The officer reported the result to the king, and the soldiers behind him threw several narrow sabers onto the ground. Heh, the people of Golden Rock Castle are really stupid. They have changed several lords but none of them are decent. It's all thanks to Wild Horse. The officer didn't forget the meritorious statesman that had helped them surround the assassins. Wild Horse came forward on foot and knelt down on one knee to show his respect to the lord. A bit surprised, King Rizhu waved for the crowd to move on. The battle in the east seemed to have broken out, and the sounds of the fighting could be clearly heard. One of the guards gave Wild Horse a horse and let him ride beside the lord. King Rishu raised his right hand with a whip in hand, wanting to make a few gestures before he suddenly remembered that this mute killer wasn't deaf. Done? Wild Horse nodded and made several gestures with his single arm. King Rishu understood the general meaning that the plan was successful. Where's Shangguan Enyu and the Dragon King? Wild Horse pointed to the camp of King Kuari in the east. Heh, those two are really anxious to win back some honor. You came back just in time. Stay with me as a bodyguard. The army's vision was obscured by the forest of tents. Ji Yushun Wei walked out of his hiding place and admiringly said, You won Wild Horse over. When did that happen? When you put Wild Horse under my command and we went out to rescue the granddaughter of the unique king. What terms did you offer him? He'll be able to set up a real killer organization, pick his own disciples, and train them himself. I'll provide some disciples of the Waning Moon Hall to help him. That's his dream. Hum, he'll be more successful than Golden Rock Castle. How many people has the Waning Moon Hall placed in the royal court? Not too many, only about a hundred people. Much better than me. The Waning Moon Hall wouldn't have had such a good chance if you hadn't attracted everyone's attention and the Norland hadn't despised women so much. The two behaved as courteously as a newly married couple. They spoke while secretly moving forward. Lotus didn't say where she was going and Ji Yushun Wei also didn't ask. Behind them was Han Fen alone. After a long silence, Ji Yushun Wei suddenly said, King Shunri's army is too weak and he himself is also unreliable. The Dragon King seemed to be thinking from the perspective of the Waning Moon Hall and wasn't satisfied with the puppet chosen by Lotus. It doesn't matter. He's just a nominal head. It's fine as long as he can stir things up when the different parties are about to call truce. After that, the three of them no longer spoke and soon arrived at the camp of the Land of Fragrance. This place was like an island, around which smoke still rose in many places. The torrent of war, which had washed away the surrounding tents, had left it alone and swept past its shores. The defense of the female soldiers was so tight that King Riz who didn't want to divide his forces to draw out the nail for the time being. Lotus waited for a while, and a disciple of the waning moon hall galloped over. Wild Horse did it. King Rizhu was luckier than King Kuari. When he was cut in the throat, what he saw was a victorious army. His guards could only watch him fall from his horse, and even the closest man could not come to his aid. Wild Horse had chosen the best moment to act, when King Rizhu decided to go to war on his own and was deep in the battlefield. Wild Horse had finally made a move when the king was surrounded by chaos. When he fled, Many on the periphery didn't even know he was an assassin and also didn't recognize the head in his hand but instead gave way for him to enter the camp of King Riyal. 
all of King Ri's whose men believed that Wild Horse had betrayed their lord to join King Ri Yao. It was then that the Battle of the Kings went out of control as Lotus had predicted. Although King Riya wanted to avenge King Kuari, he didn't lose his reasoning. Chisu, the general under King Rizhu, however, was outraged by what he had seen and issued a kill order, the targets of which was exactly Wild Horse and King Riya. The newly extinguished fire flared up again and this time it was even more vigorous than the night before. Even the people hiding in their tents in the hopes of escaping from the chaos couldn't keep their composure anymore. Like a flock of ants whose homes had been trampled apart, they mounted their horses and fled to the outskirts in panic. There was no need for Lotus and the Dragon King to hide now. People were everywhere and had formed a torrent heading the opposite direction, which also bypassed the camp of the Land of Fragrance in its sweep westward. Is this what you wanted? Most of the people who can escape are still men, and the women are left on the battlefield. Lotus smiled, this is exactly what I want, abandoned and injured women. I'll endow them with the power they desire. The three of them walked towards the camp together, and the female soldiers, who remained combat ready, cheered in unison at the sight of the Dragon King and opened the door to let them in right away. This was the Dragon King's territory. As long as Ji Yushun Wei issued an order, the female soldiers would shoot Lotus and Han Fen without hesitation. Ji Yushun Wei believed that the female soldiers had not been brought over by the waning moon hall. They were free and independent and not the type of women that Lotus wanted. Lotus wasn't afraid at all. She had hostages in her hand and she was sure the Dragon King dared not act rashly. Old Man Mu and Shangguan Fei were smilingly greeting them at the door. It's really noisy outside. Old Man Mu felt itchy to go outside. He was usually the bringer of chaos but today he wasn't even an onlooker. Very disappointed, he said, everyone is so happy that you two returned safely together. Old Man Mu, you disobeyed the order, said Lotus coldly. According to her plan, Old Man Mu should have been responsible for assassinating King Kuari. Old Man Mu looked surprised. He glanced at the Dragon King and said, Already? Made public? You don't have to pretend anymore. Ji Yushun Wei's voice was even colder and harder than that of Lotus. So you guys have decided to help each other forward? Congratulations. Lord Lotus, it's not that I was loafing on the job it was just there was an accident last night. Golden Rock Castle wanted to snatch Shangguan Yun away, and they sent several rounds of people at us last night. So I was thinking, which one was Lord Lotus most concerned about? With all due respect, I felt that Shangguan Yun had offended you before and I must keep him intact to give to you, so. Bring him out. Okay. Ah, Shangguan Yun is tied up tight. Should I carry him out or would you rather go in and teach him a lesson yourself? Would you like me to cut a piece of him off for you first? Lotus grunted and looked around. The female soldiers were stationed on the edge of the camp, and hardly anyone could be seen in the tents. No rush. I want to have a word with the Dragon King. Old Man Mu and Shangguan Fei knowingly stepped aside, bowing while retreating as if they were submissive minions. It's time for you to make a choice. Lotus decided to not wait any longer. Ji Yushun Wei looked around and said, A lot of things have not been made clear yet. Why stick to the details? If you want revenge, we can destroy Golden Rock Castle together. If you want to find the mastermind behind the scene, we can kill to the central plains together. If you want to seek hegemony, the whole world is at your disposal. This is just the beginning. I can give you anything you want. And you don't have to join the waning moon hall, we can still be allies. It was just that the primary and secondary relationship was the opposite of what it used to be. Han Fen winked again at the Dragon King, but Ji Yushun Wei pretended not to notice. The price I need to pay. That's not a price at all. Just hand over Han Wuxian to me. Honestly. I haven't met Han Wuxian yet. 
I don't know if it's appropriate to hand her over to you. The truth is simple. When I joined the waning moon hall, I took the blood coagulation pill. Han Wuxian's blood is an ingredient that must be used to make the medicine, so she's very important to me and useless to you unless you want to use her to control me. No one can control you. Ji Yushan Wei meant what he said. And you've arrested many people around me. Shangguan are you, Queen Ju, Xu Yang Wei, Red Bat. Well, they're all in my hands and kept somewhere in the Red Bat. Just think of it as a little game, and when we are allies again, they'll all be at your disposal. Han Fen could no longer bear it, so she came forward and said with a smile, let me kill them all. Dragon King, one woman is enough for you. The master commander's eyes were so stern that Han Fen couldn't help but tremble, and her smile vanished. Like a little beast being reprimanded, she flinched and retreated to the back. I told you, it's just a game. As for what you want to do with these women, it's your own business. This wasn't his own business. Ji Yushan Wei clearly knew in his heart that if he wanted to fully gain Lotus's trust, he had to get rid of those women. What if I refuse to ally with you? Then you are just another ordinary man in the world. To fight and be destroyed in chaos was the destiny that Lotus had set for ordinary men. You've made one mistake. Ji Yushan Wei was like a strict teacher who was giving a last evaluation on his favorite pupil, you created the chaos but you may be not the only one who can benefit from it. The Norland has lost its ruler, and now everyone has a chance to seize the control. Your plan is too simple. Dark nights and shadows are a good cover but there are some things that one can never do by hiding in them. What I want is more than killing. Han Fen was both surprised and disappointed. If it had not been for the presence of the master commander, she would have asked the Dragon King why he had refused such a good thing. She had already clearly told the Dragon King the real intentions of the master commander. A smile slowly appeared on Lotus's impassive face, unfathomable but gorgeous. I'm glad that you didn't lie to me. Ji Yushan Wei had told many lies and might tell many more in the future. It was a part of his entire life, but he was not lying at that moment. He could have lured Lotus into that tent, but he didn't. Draw your sword and call out your men. Let's settle this once and for all, Lotus said proudly, not at all caring that she was surrounded. The time Ji Yushan Wei had been biding for had finally came. Chapter 645, Fire Translator, Henny Translations Editor Henny Translations. It was June 29, year 289 of the Norland calendar. The people of the prairie would always remember this day for years to come. The old Khan had died, and the news was spreading. The residents of the royal court, who always thought that the chaos would stop at the last moment, had finally given up all hope. Some fled, some joined in the killing and looting, and many more became a sumptuous feast for the chaos. In this feverish atmosphere where they were still trying to confirm and find their enemies, the kings lost their coolness and accused each other of being the chief culprit of the old Khan's death, and launched a merciless massacre. Two kings died from assassinations. The tribes of King Kuari and King Rizhu became sworn enemies. And another three kings died in the chaos caused by war, sowing more hatred. Aside from all the chaos, it was particularly hot that day. Even in the early morning people felt that the air was suffocatingly hot and irritable. Even if there were no chaos of war, many people would have ridden out into the wilderness on the outskirts. The flames leaped rapidly from one dry tent to another, and had soon spread from the noble area to the surrounding areas until it finally devoured the entire royal court, including even the Khan's main tent. The royal court had become scorched earth before noon but the fire wasn't over yet. It spread into the wilderness for dozens of miles before it finally came to an end. The big fire left a deep impression on the survivors, who naturally associated it with the death of the Khan. They even inadvertently distorted the sequence of the events to form the narrative that the Khan had died as a result of the divine fire. 
Countless rumors were flying left and right at the beginning of the chaos. A great clamor had gathered around these rumors and the idea of enchantresses was quite eye-catching. Many people believed that not only had they killed the Khan but they had also spread hatred and anger everywhere. In the end, the enchantresses failed to fight off the divine fire, and the rumors gradually melded into one consistent story. The Khan was the divine fire of heaven and when he returned to his original form, he took away all the people he liked. The image of the old Khan became loftier, and the transition from demigod to god was complete. The people of the Norland preferred this rumor to the truth and treated it as a fact. From then on, many tribes even burned the living as a sacrificial offering to the old Khan every year on that day. This rumor was more lethal than the big fire in the royal court. The five surviving kings felt the mounting pressure. A month later, one of them committed suicide in public to prove that he was a son that the Khan liked. In the series of events, few people knew of or followed the skirmishes that took place in the camp of the Land of Fragrance. Although the female soldiers were inevitably labeled as enchantresses, in a few rumors, this special army from a faraway country had also been engulfed in the conflagration. Occasionally someone would talk about that duel between top-notch experts, and the audience would listen with gusto and then laugh in disdain. How can a man run while on fire? You are so good at making up stories. The Dragon King is also a mortal. It's possible if you are talking about the Khan, but the Dragon King. Ha ha, don't drink too much. You are already drunk. Old Man Mu spared no effort in publicizing the duel but no one believed him. He was very angry because he had seen it with his own eyes. The surrounding fire grew more and more intense but it hadn't yet reached the camp of the Land of Fragrance. Lotus had challenged the Dragon King but at the same time didn't. She then turned to Old Man Mu and Shangguan Fei instead. Choose. Without saying a word, Old Man Mu poked Shangguan Fei's leg. Ah, choose now, said Shangguan Fei, flustered, can't I wait until you're finished? Shangguan Fei wouldn't have said that if he had time to think twice. He was very clever but always became bewildered when he was nervous, and he would blurt out his true thoughts when confused. Compared to him, Old Man Mu was much more tactful. He pretended to seriously consider it before firmly saying after Shang Guan Fei opened his mouth, Dragon King, it has always been the Dragon King. Even when I was forced to join the waning Moon Hall's side, my heart was still with the Dragon King. Me too. Shang Guan Fei found that he had made a mistake and quickly followed it up with another statement. Feeling that it wasn't enough, he added on, Lotus is ruthless, there won't be a good ending for me if I follow her. Shang Guan Fei relaxed a bit, but when he looked down and saw old man Mu's surprised eyes, he immediately knew that he said the wrong thing again. It was enough to show his loyalty to the Dragon King, but had he offended Lotus for no reason? If the Dragon King was defeated, he wouldn't even have any room to maneuver. It was too late to correct it now. The Dragon King and Lotus had already drawn their swords. A few men came out of the tent, who had been waiting for Lotus to come into the trap, but there was no need to hide now. Long Fanyun walked in the front with a grand sword in his hand. He had finally come back in time with the reinforcements and lived up to the Dragon King's trust. The opportunity Ji Yu Shenwei had been waiting for was precisely him. The most important purpose behind Long Fanyun's escape from the royal court with the flame foal was not to avoid King Rizhu, and neither did he run back to the western regions to remind Prince Duodun to guard against the assassination of Golden Rock Castle, but rather to bring in the reinforcements previously arranged by the Dragon King. The reinforcements had set out on the East Road almost at the same time as the Dragon King, saved Han Wuxian and then slowly moved to the prairie before waiting for the Dragon King's orders. Ji Yu Shenwei wanted to make sure that Han Wuxian was really under his control. Although Lotus had said it very casually, Han Wuxian was related to her life and death for several years to come and therefore, was a powerful weapon that he could use to balance out the advantage that Lotus had gained and the hostages she had seized. 
Ji Yushinwei had to have a well-thought-out plan before he could unsheathe his sword unperturbed. He didn't want to bear the pressure that the hostage might be killed during his duel with Lotus. The two were equal in their martial arts skills, and even the slightest fluctuation in their mind could determine the outcome. The two struck at the same time, one aiming at the heart while the other targeted the throat. They had learned the same kind of swordsmanship but took different ideas away from the very beginning. The difference had eventually grown so large that it seemed like they were using two different sword techniques now. The only similarity was that both of them were incredibly fast. Shangguan Fei rarely had a chance to stand aside and watch the Dragon King use his sword without taking any personal risks, but he didn't see anything special about it. Did they even strike? Who do I feel like they only shook the sword a bit? Although the two had been circling around after exchanging one move, old man Mu was still fascinated by it. You know nothing. This is the best sword technique in the world. They are looking for each other's flaws but both of them have no flaw so they could only shake their swords a bit. Do you know how hard it is to shake it? A little more is too much, and a little less is too bad both are deadly. Old Man Mu's incessant talk was interrupted by Lotus's successive attacks. Shangguan Fei's face turned pale. I'm doomed, the Dragon King is going to lose. One, two, three, four. Ah, I can't even count how many times she's thrusted out. Fourteen. Old Man Mu's face turned stiff, not in fear, but in envy. Why didn't the Dragon King make a move? Long Fanyun also came to ask. Amongst all the people, only Old Man Mu could answer this question. He did. You just didn't see it. Old Man Mu's eyes were fixated on the two locked in the duel with a gleam of greed. He had fought against them before. At that time his power was intact and not only was he able to escape from their swords but he also sure that he could kill them in a surprise attack. Now, more than a year later, even if his power was restored to its former glory, he wasn't sure if he could do it. Lotus's swordsmanship pursued swiftness and fierceness to the extreme. With a heavy killing aura, each of her strokes seemed to be exerted with all her might. Another person might have to take a breath to perform a second stroke, but she had stabbed fourteen times in a row with almost no interval in between. With the same kind of sword technique, the Dragon King had gone the other way, and restrained all his killing aura. Lotus attacked fourteen times and he also counterattacked fourteen times. It was just that each stroke he made disappeared before reaching its extreme like an ever-changing cloud. Shangguan Fei and others saw the cloud, but only Old Man Mu saw the change. How could it be so different? Old Man Mu's eyes still didn't blink even as sweat oozed down from his forehead. The female soldiers guarding the camp also couldn't help but look on. And what they saw was much less. They could only see two people jumping and barely touching the ground like two whirlwinds clashing into together. There are enemy soldiers coming. A lot of people, shouted a female soldier. Neither of Ji Yushinwei and Lotus could stop, nor did they have time to listen to the cries of anyone else. They had never paid this much attention to each other, only having the other person in their eyes and nothing else. Han Fen felt sad for the first time as if a child had realized that her two best friends had gone their separate ways, and she could only follow one of them. The choice had already been made. She swung her arms with force and from her sleeve a thick dark smoke shot dozens of feet into the air which lingered in the air and lasted for a long time. Even though it was surrounded by countless flames, it was still clearly visible. Old Man Mu, who was the first to react, shouted, Kill her! Long Fanyun swung his sword and rushed out, several sabermen following. Shangguan Fei hesitated a bit and also followed. Old Man Mu moved but his eyes were still on the Dragon King and Lotus. He was really reluctant to stop watching the duel. Han Fen was like an experienced conjurer. Colorful smokes came from her sleeves, hemline, mouth, and even from nowhere. 
Soon the pursuers behind her had fallen into a fog, coughing and hurriedly retreating for fear that it might be poisonous. The flamboyant smoke formed a circle and surrounded the dragon king and lotus. Han Fen then disappeared. It's the female soldiers of the flower camp. The female archers of the land of fragrance felt a little relieved, and then dozens of them cheered in unison, the instructor. It's the instructor. The 1,000 female soldiers immediately turned their attention from the smoke and the duel. The instructor Shangguan Ryu was the one they cared most about. Ji Yushenwei and Lotus hadn't yet reached the level of turning a deaf ear to the surroundings. Upon hearing the word instructor, both of them were surprised and even their sword moves slowed down. The swordsmanship that lost its killing momentum was no longer the death sutra sword technique. Old man Mu sighed but then cheered up. Good girl has escaped by herself. The bad girl is going to bite the dust. Outside the camp came a familiar voice that was not loud but carried far, retreat, retreat now, the big fire is coming. Most people's attention had been attracted by the Dragon King and Lotus's competition. Upon hearing the reminder, they finally came to their senses and found that there were flames in all directions which, though still some distance from the camp, would become a catastrophe once it reached the camp. The appearance of Shangguan Ryu greatly increased the morale of the female soldiers, who jumped down the wooden ladders, led the horses, and lined up to retreat to the outside of the camp, busy but in good order. Old Man Mu shouted towards the center of the smoke, stop fighting and start running for your life. Both Ji Yushenwei and Lotus refused to stop. The sword moves, which had slowed down, soon became deadly again. Both of them wanted to end it today. A group of female soldiers tried to rush into the smoke to help but retreated as soon as they got close. A blazing fire flared up inside the colorful smoke, which crackled and looked very frightening. Looking from afar, Shangguan Ayu saw two small figures jumping and moving swiftly over the gorgeous fireworks, who seemed less like enemies fighting to the death and more a pair of spirits dancing in unison. Dragon King Shangguan Ayu cried out. The spirits fell into the flames. Chapter 646, Monks Translator, Henyi Translations Editor, Henyi Translations Shangguan Ayu had a long dream. When she woke up, she thought that the houseful of monks was still part of the strange dream. Then she saw a thin old monk smiling kindly at her. I know you. We've met before. Oh, at the Stone Kingdom of Xiaoyao Lake. You are Feian of the Four Noble Truths Temple, also the martial uncle of Master Lianhua. Shangguan Ayu blurted out a series of titles and immediately came to her senses and sat up from the blanket. She was surprised to find that all of these monks were real. She was in a large tent and surrounded by monks and nuns either sitting or lying down, all listless. Occasionally they whispered to each other but they remained silent most of the time. What is this place? Shangguan Ayu was in a daze and could not recall any memories after she had fainted. The forbidden zone of the northern royal court, replied Feiyan. The forbidden zone? The flower camp? Feiyan smiled and shook his head, no, this is the prison of the forbidden zone. Ah. Shangguan Ayu bounced up then fell to the ground, aghast. My internal energy, then she remembered everything. She and old man Mu had sneaked into King Rizhu's office and taken out three bone-shriveling pills, but they had been surprise attacked on their way to the camp. It's her, whispered Shangguan Ayu. She hadn't seen the attacker but was familiar with the knockout drug. It was basically a modified Indra fragrance of the land of fragrance that could make people lose their internal energy without turning them into the walking dead. There was only one person who knew how to make and modify such a drug, Lotus. Why? Shangguan Ayu was confused. Then she turned to Feiyan. How did you also come to the royal court and get locked up? Before Feiyan opened his mouth a middle-aged monk standing behind him angrily said, who else could it be except for the Khan? 
He invited us here but after Master said a few words about not indulging in sensual pleasures, he actually listened to the slanders of the wicked and said that my Master was the one who was slandering and imprisoned us all, saying that no one would be released unless we provided him with a way to live forever or some sex techniques. We are Buddhist disciples, so how could we know these things? It's the Taoist priests who. Lianqing, you're being too testy. Amitapa. Yes, master. Lianqing sat down onto the futon in a lotus position and started chanting a sutra in a low voice. Shangguan Ayu also remembered this monk who used to be a robber. In order to kill the dragon king to avenge his brother, he had entered the temple and become a monk but was eventually inspired by the Dharma and became a real monk even though his temper was as hot as before. Your kung fu is very good. Why don't you run away? Forty-three monks are being held here. I won't be able to take them all away with me. If I run away, they will get into trouble because of me, Feian said in a soft tone and didn't seem anxious at all. Lianqing opened his eyes and couldn't help but interrupt again. Master is merciful, but unfortunately the others don't appreciate it at all. Shangguan Ayu was also aware of this. Although the monks were confined to the same tent, they were not united. They had their own little cliques and didn't always talk to each other. This was quite different from the image she had in her mind that all monks were in harmony with the rest of the world. What's going on? The Khan couldn't have been so foolish as to keep the monks and the nuns together. Exactly. Lianqing slapped his thigh, still unable to change the old habits from when he had been a robber. And he also put you, a pretty little girl here. He's trying to tempt us into breaking the precept. Shangguan are you blushed. I'm not a little girl. Lianqing put his palms together devoutly and said, I won't break the precept for you but I'm not sure about the others. Be careful. Lianqing glanced at several monks in the opposite corner with a contemptuous look. Lianqing, do not talk nonsense. Feian appeared to be quite kind even when scolding his disciple as if he was politely discussing something with the other side. Lianqing, who was very obedient, closed his eyes and restarted chanting the sutra, no longer speaking for a long time. The monks who were accused by Lianqing came over, but their target wasn't Shangguan Ayu but rather Feian. Feian, it's been a month now. You'd better hand over the secret manual. Saving us from the abyss of misery is also a charitable deed for you. The man who spoke was a tall, thin monk of forty or fifty years old who looked dignified and seemed to have held a high position both before and after he became a monk. Master Kumi, I don't have the secret manual, and thus I really don't know how to hand it over. As for how to get everyone out, I'll figure it out. Feian had said this many times but the other side just didn't believe him. The monk whose Buddhist name was Kumi sneered scornfully. Lianqing opened his eyes and glared at him but didn't join in the dispute. Shangguan Ayu, who had learned the essay of severing obsession from Master Lianhua of the Four Noble Truths Temple, had gotten rid of all of her killing desire. Even now, she still recited a chapter of it almost every day. So, she had a rather good opinion of Feian. Seeing that he was embarrassed, she couldn't help but defend him, you are really a boring monk. Feian is an eminent monk of the Four Noble Truths Temple, do you think he will lie to you? Kumi shot a cold glance at Shangguan are you, who are you? What makes you think you can grant him the title of eminent monk? My name is Shangguan are you. Where did you come from? What makes you think you can force others to hand over a secret manual? Although Shangguan Ayu's murderous heart had been abolished, her pride didn't diminish by much. She had been depressed for a while after being abandoned by her parents but she had recovered back to normal long ago. This is Master Kumi of the National Temple of the Norland. Show your respect, little girl, a young monk near Kumi said in a hurry. He is Master Kumi, and you must be Master Flattery. I've never seen a monk as obsequious as you. The young monk flushed with shame and only at Kumi's signal did he control his temper. 
Are you also from the western regions? asked Kumi. Hem Shangguan Ayu replied with her head held high. She didn't like these monks from the very beginning. What's your relationship with the unique King Shangguan F.A.? Shangguan Ayu didn't know what to say. Her father used to be the person who loved her the most but had nonetheless still sacrificed her for nothing in the end. Every time she thought of this she felt heartbroken, so she was very reluctant to mention him. Kumi was from the Norland and knew little about the rumors of the western regions, but he realized that the woman in front of him must be a niece or daughter of the unique king. Young benefactor, you may be not aware of this. Feyan hid the secret manual of immortality somewhere and refuses to hand it over, and therefore, angered the Khan. All of us were implicated, and even the whole of Buddhism might be affected. How could a secret manual of immortality exist? You are a master and yet you still believe such nonsense. The young monk around Kumi interrupted again, He he, you are from the western regions, but have you never heard of Feyan's ultra-long life? He's over 140 years old this year. If he doesn't have a secret manual of immortality, he must be a monster. Lianqing glared at the young monk but remained silent. Feyan revealed a bitter smile. Honesty does not lie. I'm actually six to seven years old this year. I entered the temple since I was little, so maybe outsiders have some misunderstanding about me. Instead of saying whether he had misunderstood or not, Kumi lowered his voice and said, Could the heterodox doctrines of immortality be true? Your honored temple has many manuals, aren't there any that can help people achieve longevity? Hand them over to the Khan and we will all be free. Kumi actually said this sarcastically but Feyan didn't get it. He took it seriously and thought for a while before saying, we do have several manuals that can keep people fit and healthy but it can't extend people's life. Besides, the Khan is too old to practice them now. When all is said and done, it's not that you don't have it. It's that you're just unwilling to hand it over. Kumi raised his voice and the monks and nuns in the tent all cast a disapproving look at Feiyun. Shangguan Ayu was just about to defend Feiyun when a middle-aged officer entered from outside the tent. Following him were a dozen or so servants who carried food. Hey, baldies, it's breakfast time. Do not rush. Nuns in the front, and monks in the back. Eh? How come one of them even has hair? And it's pretty beautiful. Come over and let me have a look. Shangguan Ayu blushed crimson. Since she was powerless now, she could only swallow the humiliation. The young monk around Kumi gloated over her misfortune. Seeing that his order didn't work, the officer became angry and strode forward, pushing and kicking all the way, during which several monks and nuns fell down. Playing dumb? Let me check. The officer reached out to touch her cheek. Shangguan Ayu, though she had lost her internal energy, could still exert 10 or 20 percent of her bodily movement technique, and easily dodged it. The officer didn't expect that he would miss. After a pause, he waved his arm and continued trying to catch the agile woman. Finally, he did it, though it was just that he had grabbed the wrong person. The young monk near Kumi covered his face and embarrassedly looked at the officer. Damn it, damn bad luck. The officer pushed the monk away, spread his arms and said to Shangguan Ayu who was several steps away, No one will eat today unless I have you. Although the tent was not small, it still appeared quite crowded with over forty people. Shangguan Ayu had dodged several times in a row. She was thinking about how to extricate herself when she suddenly tripped and almost fell. The officer leaped forward. Let me see if you are a crossdresser. The officer flew out and fell into one of the big buckets before he could finish the words. Two servants anxiously carried him out but he was already stained with rice grains, and it wasn't easy to clean the mess up. Who? Who was it? The officer drew his saber and barked viciously. He had clearly seen that it was not the little girl who had kicked him. Shangguan Ayu also saw it clearly. 
The person who had saved her was Lian Qing. Lian Qing had experienced a lot of setbacks before he became a monk and because of this, he took the Buddhist commandments very seriously. The officer's salacious behavior made him so angry that he didn't even care about breaking the precept of abstaining from anger. He clenched his fists and glared at the officer, stating, it's me. The officer raised his saber but changed his mind on second thought. Lianqing had shown his kung fu before when the monks and nuns were being held, and the officer knew that he was no match for him. So he pointed his saber at Lianqing while retreating to the door, good, you lecherous monk, daring to compete with me for a woman. I'll give you the chance, you wait and see. The servants left with the buckets. Breakfast was over. Shang Guan Ayu thanked Lianqing, but Lianqing confessed his sin to Fei'en. Master, I failed to hold back again. It's right for a man to give his hand to save others. You are not violating the precepts. Fei'en comforted his disciple and then turned to Shangguan Ayu, your lightness skills are very good. Before Shangguan Ayu could speak, Kumi grunted, it's right for a man to give his hand to others. There are over forty people here, but I haven't seen you save anyone. The atmosphere in the tent wasn't very friendly. Shang Guan Ayu sat behind Fei'en and Lianqing and focused on guiding her internal qi, hoping to recover soon. One had to take the antidote to remove the effect of the Indra fragrance before they could use internal qi again, but Lotus had made some changes to the Indra fragrance, so the drug effect seemed to have been greatly weakened. The officer was back again before noon, and this time a woman had come with him. With a cold face, the woman had an obvious temperament of a killer. Shang Guan Ayu didn't know her personally but knew that she was a disciple of the waning moon hall. By the order of the Khan, whoever breaks the lust ring in this tent will be released and promoted to be an official of the Norland, and won't have to be a monk from now on. The woman said, looking meaningfully at Shang Guan Ayu while the officer lightly shook his head in disappointment. Chapter 647 Breaking the Precept. Translator, Henyi Translations Editor, Henyi Translations. Shang Guan Ayu didn't believe this was all Lotus's idea. I want to see your master commander. The disciple of the waning moon hall stared at her coldly for a moment before saying, you'll see her soon. Then she turned away and left. The monks and nuns could hardly believe that this was an idea of the Khan's. Many of them had seen this prairie demigod and felt that he would not do such a degrading thing. The officer regretfully shook his head. Now you regret it, seems like I'm better than these baldies after all. Then he turned to everyone else to say, the higher-ups know that there are too many monks and too few nuns. The so-called problem of too many monks and too little gruel, so I'll add some gruel for you. Proud of his metaphor the officer chuckled and also left. The gruel wasn't sent right away. The first that arrived was a few buckets of rice. The Norland people didn't farm so the rice had been imported from the central plains and other places and was naturally very expensive. The monks were actually given preferential treatment and therefore, many people believed that the Khan would not force them to break their precept of abstaining from sexual misconduct. It must have been the officer playing tricks all along, and he will soon be stopped. Amitapur, this person will surely go to hell after death. While the monks and nuns talked about the matter, Shangguan Ayu went to the door, lifted the curtain, and found that there were no guards outside. They were in a small square camp with a total of seven or eight tents surrounded by a dense picket fence, amongst which the tent that imprisoned the monks and nuns was the largest. Outside was a separate picket fence that only had a single small door. Shang Guan Ayu was standing in what looked like a courtyard and was immediately noticed by the guards outside. There were many watchtowers around the small camp, with four in each of the four corners, two on each side, and one in the middle of the camp for a total of thirteen watchtowers. Each watchtower had three to five soldiers in it, who immediately drew their bows and aimed at Shang Guan Ayu as soon as she walked out. She observed it all for a moment and felt a little strange. 
this place wasn't like a temporary place of detention. It seemed to be the official prison of the royal court. How could Lotus have the clout to bring her here? But if the one who had kidnapped her was another person, then what could explain the familiar knockout drugs and the woman with the unique temperament of a waning moon hall disciple? Shangguan Ayu returned to the tent. She couldn't figure it out for the time being but deep in her heart, she knew that as long as her internal energy was restored, she could easily escape from this place and that she could then go to the second consort and the Khan to ask for an explanation. As for Lotus, Shangguan Ayu had always felt that something wasn't right. In this short period of time while Shangguan Ayu was out, the monks and nuns in the tent had split on their opinions, which had been simmering for many days and had boiled over today. Over thirty monks were gathered near the tent door where it was a little cooler, the head monk of this group being Kumi. Eight or nine nuns sat on one side and kept their distance from the monks. One of the nuns waved at Shangguan Ayu when she appeared. Shangguan Ayu smiled back but walked to the two monks in the innermost section. Feian and Lianqing were isolated with no one around them within ten steps. Upon seeing Shangguan Ayu walk towards them, Lianqing was very happy. But he knew it was inappropriate, so he stood up and said in a low voice, it's better for you to sit over there. Most of the monks were eating and chatting which was a perfect cover for their talks. Shangguan Ayu smilingly said, that's all right. I'll sit here. We're all from Jade City and we should take care of each other. Lianqing was thinking the same and cast a challenging look at other monks. Hey monk, it seems easy to get away from here, Shangguan Ayu eagerly said to Feiyun. And the Khan thinks that you have the secret manual of immortality. If you run away, the others will be all right. Lianqing interrupted before Feiyun spoke. Although he appreciated Shangguan Ayu's choice, he still couldn't change his tone of banditry, which always sounded full of anger and ferocity. Do you think that we don't understand that? But this is the Khan's territory. As long as he wills it, the whole of Norland and half of the western regions will become a prison. If my master runs away, the monks here will take the blame. The Four Noble Truths Temple and even all of Jade City will suffer no matter how advanced your father's kung fu is. Shangguan Ayu hadn't thought so far. The Khan is so unreasonable. How can he lock up others just because he can't live forever? Exactly. Lianqing punched the center of his left palm with his right hand, showing his agreement. But you can't blame the Khan completely. He did this because he was misled by the villains. The villains? Of course. I was really pissed off. These people are also from Jade City but have no neighborliness at all. It was exactly them who told the Khan that my master was over a hundred years old and also them that taught the Khan sexual techniques, attracting a lot of Ivaldas. Lianqing looked really angry, his eyes wide open and his fists clenched. Shangguan Ayu immediately had an image of a bandit getting furious and ready to kill in her mind. From Jade City? Do I know them? The weirdos of the Essence Pavilion. You must have heard of them even if you haven't seen them before, right? Shangguan Ayu nodded. Unlike the Dragon King and Lotus, she didn't have an instinctive reaction to intrigue and craftiness. She just felt strange. She thought for a while before finally understanding. So it's not the Khan who wants the secret manual of immortality but rather the disciples of the Essence Pavilion who want to force the For Noble Truths Temple to hand over the martial arts manuals. Feiyun smiled without a word. Lianqing, however, jumped up over a foot high and scratched his head after landing, yes, that's it. Little girl, you really are smart. Why didn't I think of that? I'm not a little girl. Right how should I address you then? She had a lot of identities, some of which she disliked and some that she felt too embarrassed to say out aloud. You can call me Shangguan are you? Shangguan are you? Hum, that's strange. So why did the Khan send you here? Do you have the method to achieve immortality? No, no. 
Shang Guan Ayu hastily denied it but refused to give the reason. The young monk, who had been serving Kumi, felt that the name Shang Guan Ayu was very familiar. He muttered her name over and over until he finally remembered, loudly exclaiming, Shang Guan Ayu, isn't that the queen of the land of fragrance? The monks and nuns had been held for nearly a month and knew little about what had occurred in the royal court. They didn't know the news of the Dragon King's visit. Upon hearing this, all of them were surprised and simultaneously turned to look at Shangguan Ayu, whispering to each other. No, you don't look like a queen, Lianqing said in a matter-of-factly tone. I was never a queen in the first place. Shangguan Ayu flushed. She didn't like being stared at by so many people. The attention lasted for a quarter of an hour, and when the lunch was over and the servant packed it all up and left, she was finally free because what the officer had called Grawl had arrived. This was a woman that wasn't a nun judging from her dress. The escort took off her hood and left without a word. Standing in the doorway, the woman blankly looked at the baldies in the tent, her body swaying and seemingly unable to support herself. She looked very tired, and her hair was a little disheveled but it extruded a peculiar elegant disposition and seductive charm. The monks couldn't take their eyes off of her and even the nuns couldn't help but be jealous. Shangguan Ayu was also very pretty but whether she admitted it or not, she still seemed immature and was quite different from this mature and gorgeous new woman. The woman seemed to be used to these kind of stares and showed no trace of shyness and timidity. Instead, she grew more and more bewildered. Where is this? she asked. Then she took a step forward but nearly fell. Over a dozen monks stuck out their hands at the same time but also drew back at the same time. Some turned around, some coughed, and others even continued chatting sutras, all feeling very embarrassed. Xiao Feng Chai. Shang Guan are you finally recognized this woman? And you are? Xiao Feng Chai didn't recognize Shang Guan are you? Several years ago, Shangguan Ayu had kidnapped the courtesan of the retention alley for a short time. But she had been wearing a mask and was very young at that time and therefore, hadn't left an impression on her. Shangguan Ayu was very happy to finally meet someone that she knew. She walked over and helped Xiao Feng Chai to fay inside and let her sit on a futon. Before Xiao Feng Chai could ask, Lian Qing suddenly patted his head and said, Xiao Feng Chai aren't you the number one prostitute in the retention alley of Jade City? His voice wasn't small. Everyone in the room heard him. The monks, who had ducked their heads, secretly peeped while the nuns glanced at her with obviously disdainful eyes and even their impression of Shangguan Ayu grew worse. Unaware of how long she had been in the carriage, Xiao Feng Chai still felt shaky but she gradually calmed her mind and looked up at the monk, and coldly said, So, you've been to my place before. I don't remember ever having a monk customer like you. Lianqing blushed, omitted her. Before I became a monk, I visited the retention alley a few times but never had the luck to meet Miss Yao. Hey, that's fine. I thought that you'd spent all your money on me and had no choice but to be a monk. Lianqing's face turned even redder. Xiao Feng Chai's customers were either rich people or nobles. He was indeed not qualified to meet her but like many men, he also had many fantasies about the most popular woman in the retention alley. Amitapa. Lianqing felt that his cultivation over the years was in danger of being destroyed in one day. Ashamed, he turned his back to Xiao Feng Chai and chanted sutras in a low voice, not daring to look at her again. To those who knew her and helped her, Xiao Feng Chai, however, was very polite. Who are you, little girl? How do you know me? Shang Guan are you? We've met before. Thinking of that childish kidnapping, Xiao Feng Chai suddenly realized who the little girl was and said with a smile, I was wondering which little girl would have such gallantry. So it's the tenth Gongzi of Jade City. Shang Guan Ayu's face was as red as Lianqing's. Neither little girl nor tenth Gongzi were titles that she liked. How did you get here? 
Xiao Feng Chai skillfully arranged her hair and said, I was also wondering this. Who could have imagined that an experienced person like me would become careless and be drugged in my own house? I don't know why I was brought here, and no one told me the reason along the way. I'm really confused, to the point that my puzzlement is almost killing me. This is the royal court. We are all in the Khan's prison. Xiao Feng Chai was dumbfounded. She had tens of thousands of ways to deal with women and money but she still didn't understand why she would end up being thrown into a group of monks and nuns. The Khan? If he invited me, I definitely would have come. Why did he kidnap me? Feiyan, who had been silent all the time, opened his mouth. I'm afraid it has nothing to do with the Khan. He's just providing a place. If it has nothing to do with him, then who kidnapped me? Shangguan Ayu was even more confused than Xiaofeng Chai. If Lotus had kidnapped her out of jealousy, then why did she kidnap Xiaofeng Chai from the faraway Jade City? After all, Xiaofeng Chai had nothing to do with the Dragon King. A young monk at the door suddenly stood up and started tearing his robe, shouting, I can't bear it anymore. I'm going to break the precept. The monk fixed his greedy eyes on Xiaofeng Chai like a hungry wolf. Although Xiaofeng Chai was confident about her appearance, she didn't expect that she had such a huge draw. Shangguan Ayu's heart moved a bit and she blurted out, the rice. The young monk was not the only monk who had become restless. Over a dozen monks' eyes changed. Although the rest of the monks managed to sit quietly and meditate, they weren't able to stop their companions. They were all people with a strong degree of self-control who would rather die than act like a fool in public if not having been stimulated by drugs. Chapter 648 Committing Evil Translator, Henny Translations Editor, Henny Translations Shangguan Ayu felt more and more that this wasn't something Lotus would do. Kidnapping and espionage weren't at all a part of the killer's style. Yes, the Waning Moon Hall was well versed in all kinds of fantastic secret arts and knockout drugs, and they made full use of them to kill, sometimes even outdoing the Golden Rock Castle. But it was exactly because of this that they rarely wasted them on anything other than killing. Shangguan Ayu's impression of Lotus was that of a person with a bottom line. Everyone said that the disciples of the Waning Moon Hall were all crazy, but throughout all the tough times Shangguan Ayu had spent with her in the Land of Fragrance, she hadn't found anything unusual. In spite of the repeated betrayals she had suffered and the fact that those closest to her kept secrets from her, Shangguan Ayu still persisted in trusting her own judgment. But this was not the most urgent problem at hand. There were already twenty or so monks who were on the verge of losing control, each acting as a catalyst for the others. Everyone had the same idea in mind, why can't I do it if he can? Most of the nuns on the other side were very old and therefore could still keep their composure, but there were two younger nuns whose hearts were beginning to beat faster and their bodies heating up. They couldn't help but look up at the monks near the door. Though they didn't get up, their eyes said everything implicitly. But most of the monks were still focused on Xiaofeng Chai. These people were disciples of the famous temples and had little contact with the mundane world. Just the word prostitute was enough to make them blush and their hearts beat fast, not to mention the one in front of them who was a real courtesan and looked more gorgeous than the enchantress that occasionally entered their dreams. Xiaofeng Chai's face turned pale. Although she was a prostitute, she wasn't humble, and she was even more reserved than many high-born maidens. Tenth Gongzi, your kung fu is very good, isn't it? Shangguan Ayu comforted her, saying, don't worry. I won't let them lay a finger on you. Having said that, she was actually unsure about if she could keep her promise. If there were only one to two monks, or even three to four, she was sure she could handle it even if she had no internal energy left. But with so many people grouping up, it was hard to protect herself, let alone others. The best course of action would have been to rush out of the tent as the courtyard had more room to maneuver, but the monks happened to have barricaded the door. Masters, it's time to get up and help. 
Shang Guan Ayu could only ask the senior monks of the Fun Noble Truths Temple for help. But she was taken aback at what she saw when she looked down. Feian was all right. Though his smile was a little stiff, he looked normal with his eyes closed, still meditating. Lianqing, however, was staring at Xiao Feng Chai and Shang Guan Ayu with his eyes wide open and a posture of a hungry tiger whose eyes roved over their bodies as he whispered to himself with a low voice, she's a prostitute, there's nothing I can't touch. This is not the retention alley, and there's no need to worry it about even if I don't have money. The monks looked at each other. When one person took a step forward, those next to him would take a step as well and half like a multifooted monster, the group slowly pressed forward towards the two women who were in the innermost of the room. Perhaps feeling that Shang Guan Ayu was also trembling in fear, Xiao Feng Chai knew that this tenth Gongzi might not be able to protect her, so she steeled her heart and stood out in front of Shang Guan Ayu instead. She held her head high and asked, Who's in charge here? Xiao Feng Chai, who had just arrived, hadn't exchanged much more than a few cursory words with Shang Guan Ayu and didn't know what was going on, so she thought that as long as there was someone in charge here she could subdue him. No one answered her question. The monks were engaged in a fierce struggle. Like normal people, they had to find a suitable excuse before breaking their precepts and doing evil. The servant monk of Kumi straightened his justifications first, and he pointed to Xiao Feng Chai and loudly said, She's a whore, a demon that has come to bewitch the world, and we are going to subdue the demon. Subdue the demon, subdue the demon, the other monks echoed and shuffled forward a little. If even the Buddha was seduced by the enchantress, then how can we persist? We don't have the Buddha's composure, and we are thus forced to break the precept. We are forced, forced, the monks were eager to try, leaving only a thin layer of obstacles in their hearts. Women are all demons. Nobody knew who yelled this out, but it was the signal for the monks to rush up in a crowd falling over one another. Only Lianqing who was sitting besides the two had a favorable position, and therefore wasn't affected. He jumped to his feet, shouting, that's what prostitutes do. Then he stretched out his arms though he tried to grab both Xiao Feng Chai and Shang Guan Ayu at the same time. Amitapa. A thunderous chant rang out, which rumbled in everyone's ears. The crowd tottered and almost fell. Lianqing's kung fu, however, was very good and therefore, he was hurt the most, falling to the ground and fainting after a short yelp. Shang Guan Ayu and Xiao Feng Chai supported each other and therefore were the ones who stood the firmest in the tent. Feian's smile wilted, and he began reciting a sutra that all the monks and nuns were unfamiliar with. Its pronunciation was strange and the tone equally dull, but it had the power to directly reach a person's heart. It was like thunder, successive and endless, and also like the ocean, wave upon wave, reaching for the sky. The monks had never heard of the scripture but Shang Guan Ayu was very familiar with it. It was precisely the essay of severing obsession that she had learned from Master Lianhua and recited every day. But Feian's pronunciation of it was very different from what she had heard before and the effect was also quite different. She could only use it to remove her murderous heart but the old skinny monk could influence others with it, and he could also remove more than just killing desire. Shang Guan Ayu involuntarily followed along in reciting it in a soft voice and gradually calmed down and was no longer disturbed no matter how Feian's voice changed. Xiao Feng Chai was probably the only person in the room who was not influenced by the old monk. She found the chanting of the sutra to be dull and toneless and worst of all, it was incredibly loud. So she was amazed when Shang Guan Ayu actually began chanting along with the monk. Although she had experienced countless hardships and obstacles in her life, never once had she been so bewildered as now, not even knowing who her enemy was. The chanting lasted for a quarter of an hour and didn't stop until the officer burst in with several soldiers. It's FXKN noisy, shut up. Feian stopped. Over forty monks and nuns, except for the unconscious Lianqing, all sat upright as if they had been enlightened and became Buddha. 
The officer, who had come with the intention of seeing something unsightly, didn't expect it to end up like this. I have to bring more women. I guess these two are not enough. The officer left. The monks and nuns started meditating again, none of them thanking Fayin. Shangguan Ayu admired the senior monk very much and kneeled respectfully while facing him, trying to say something several times but stopped every time she opened her mouth. Fayin slowly opened his eyes and smiled again. The early deaths of Lianhua and Lianxin really was a great loss to Buddhism. Thinking of the tiger monk who had helped cure her disease and Lianhua who had taught her the essay of severing obsession, Shangguan Ayu suddenly felt sadness well up in her heart and almost burst into tears. Xiao Feng Chai, who didn't understand what the monk had said, interjected, many thanks to the old monk who knows magic. I've seen monks visit the retention alley before but I've never seen any monks as impatient and lustful as they are. Someone drugged the rice, Shangguan Ayu explained in a soft voice. I see. I didn't know the tricks of the retention alley are also popular in the royal court. Xiao Feng Chai who looked solemn continued sitting on her knees side by side with Shangguan Ayu, ready to listen to the eminent monk's speech. She had already taken Feiyan to be the one in charge of the tent. Master has such an amazing technique, why don't you use it to enlighten the world? Well versed in the essay of severing obsession, Shangguan Ayu was immediately intrigued after finding that it had such a magical effect. It was like someone who had practiced a set of sword techniques for decades and suddenly heard that it had another set of formidable moves, and was naturally overjoyed at the news. The unconscious Lianqing happened to wake up at the moment. Hearing this, he was so ashamed that he hid behind his master and dared not even look at the two women. Feiyan smiled and shook his head. People's minds are always complicated and unpredictable. Each influences may bring unexpected results, and today's cleansing may become tomorrow's evil thoughts. And as you've just heard, People can still find an excuse to break their precepts even after years of studying Buddhism. Xiao Feng Chai was more experienced than Shangguan Ayu and therefore, was deeply touched by the senior monk's words. She sighed and said, it's not just the monks. This kind of thing happens every day in the retention alley. The more sanctimonious they look, the more vicious they are to our sisters and they often act under the banner of benevolence and righteousness and morality, as if them going out whoring with prostitutes is a great act of benevolence. They always treat us as nothing good or sometimes don't even treat us as humans at all so that they can justify treating us inhumanly. He who does evil to prostitutes thinks he's performing righteous acts on behalf of heaven. Feyen nodded. Benefactress is quite right. Spellbound by what the other two were saying, though Lianqing was too embarrassed to turn his head, he could not refrain from interjecting, saying, there are plenty of people everywhere doing evil deeds with good cause. Just look at those emperors. They obviously want to satisfy their own desires of conquering new land but always list several serious crimes of the other side and call their opponents worse than pigs and dogs. Alas, even bandits are the same. Back then, my brothers and I always said that the rich people were heartless and we had to rob them to feed the poor. But in fact, no matter if they were kind or unkind, we would rob them as long as they were rich but powerless. We would hide far away if the ones we met were from Golden Rock Castle or the Meng family. As for assisting the poor, that was a joke. If we gave a beggar a few pieces of silver, we would keep mentioning it for a lifetime. Shangguan Ayu was shocked to the core upon hearing these words because what the three had just said was strangely similar to that of Old Man Mu, and she had never taken Old Man Mu's crooked heretical ideas seriously. There's a, devil who told me once that there were four levels of villainy in the world. The lowest villains make up reasons for doing evil like what you've just said, the average villains are forced by reasons provided by others to justify their actions. For example, revenge. The advanced villains create their own reasons, and the top villains don't need reasons at all, so these devils commit all manners of evil. Lianqing let out a long sigh. It turns out I used to be the lowest of the Evalders. 
Feyen actually didn't think this theory was all nonsense and praised instead. The benefactor who said this is a man of great comprehension, but it's a pity that the conclusion he drew is completely wrong. What else can be concluded from these words? Xiao Feng Chai couldn't believe it. She felt that her level was a bit higher than Lian Qing's but hadn't yet reached the level of needing no reason at all. That benefactor saw that good and evil are inseparably interconnected and therefore believed that doing evil was the root of the world. But what I see is that good will always exist just like how the shadows always follow behind you. Everything has the heart of the Buddha, and that's what the saying laying down the butcher knife and becoming Buddha means. If needing no reason is the reason, then what's the difference between the top villains and the lowest villains? Shangguan Ayu suddenly understood. She had never thought about Old Man Mu's words seriously. Now after thinking it carefully, Old Man Mu was actually making up excuses to do evil deeds. It was just that his excuses were more complicated and more reasonable but essentially they were no different from the lowly villains he had despised. Can the Avaldor ever change into a well-doer? Shang Guan Ayu's voice was trembling. This was the long haunting secret and expectation of her, if the Dragon King could get rid of his evil thoughts. Chapter 649, Women Translator, Henyi Translations Editor, Henyi Translations Can an Evaldor ever change into a well-doer? Feiyan smiled without answering the question. Shang Guan Ayu's enthusiasm gradually dissipated when she realized that the monk had actually answered her question. Since the good always exists like how the shadows always follow behind, it didn't matter whether the Evaldor ever changed into a well-doer, the most important thing was that one could only rely on oneself to discover the good inside their hearts, not external forces and that subsequently meant that even the essay of severing obsession should not be used often, let alone other means. Upon unintentionally revealing what was in her heart, Shang Guan Ayu couldn't help blushing while simultaneously feeling a bit disappointed. But she was able to quickly regain control of herself and put her shyness aside, saying, Anyways, we've got to get out of here, everybody. Xiao Feng Chai was more interested in the topic of flight than the topic of good and evil. Do you have a solution? Oh, right, you're the queen of the land of fragrance and you have an army. They will come to save you, won't they? I'm not a queen, just an instructor of a group of female soldiers. They don't know that I'm being held here and can't come to the rescue even if they want to. As for the solution, there will be one sooner or later. Xiao Feng Chai revealed an understanding smile. The shaky and bumpy feeling of the long journey was fading and she slowly returned to her charming and graceful bearing as fit for the most popular courtesan of the retention alley. Although the whole matter was really odd, since the other side hadn't killed her right away, there was still some room to maneuver. Instructor Shangguan, I actually have a plan. Oh? Shangguan Ayu was very surprised. Lianqing also could not help but turn his head around to look at her. However it is, since he had me kidnapped from far away, will meet me one day. I will ask him to release you and these two masters. As for the others, let them figure out a way themselves. Xiao Feng Chai hadn't intended to save Lianqing but included him in the end for the sake of Feiyun. Unaware of the reluctance of the other side's words, Lianqing asked, that's your plan. Why would they listen to you? Without even raising her eyebrows or her head, Xiao Feng Chai simply smiled, and Lianqing immediately felt ashamed and lowered his head, which made her following words very convincing. As long as he's a man, he'll agree with me. Lianqing was completely convinced while Feiyun didn't object. Only Shang Guan Ayu sighed and said, I'm afraid that the one who kidnapped you is not necessarily a man. Xiao Feng Chai was stunned. Not a man? Why would a woman kidnap me? Could it be, she immediately remembered that she had been kidnapped by the tenth Gongzi before in order to lure a customer out? Could it be the second brother's lover? Xiao Feng Chai's companion was Meng Mingxu, the second son of the Meng family of Jade City. Upon hearing that the kidnapper might be a woman, 
the first reason she thought of was him. Shang Guan Ayu still had many doubts in mind and couldn't answer Xiao Feng Chai's question, but she knew that Xiao Feng Chai's guess was definitely wrong. The monks all followed the precept of taking no food after midday so supper was only a bucket of water. However, they were afraid that the water was also drugged and hesitated for a long time until they couldn't bear it any longer. But they all looked at Fei Yan while drinking, expecting to receive help from him but reluctant to ask for it. Shang Guan Ayu and Xiao Feng Chai were hungry but they were still able to resist it, which actually helped them reduce the embarrassment of going to the washing room. Although there were two latrines outside the tent for men and women respectively, they were extremely rudimentary and smelly. It was so disgusting that on Xiao Feng Chai and Shang Guan Ayu's first visit there, they returned before they even went inside. And this famous courtesan of the retention alley had then wept for the first time since the age of 13. This really isn't a place for humans. Who the hell kidnapped me? The next afternoon, more clues arrived. Adding some gruel, as the officer put it. Three people stood at the door of the tent, bewildered after their hoods were taken off. Just like how Xiao Feng Chai had arrived, they had no idea why they had come here. The monks automatically stepped aside and concentrated on chanting, fearing that the guards would play new tricks. Shang Guan Ayu felt that the identities of the three newcomers was both expected and surprising. She recognized two of them, from which she guessed the identity of the third person. Xu Yang Wei came to her senses first. As she glanced through the baldies, her eyes suddenly lit up. Miss Ayu. How come you? Eh, Xiao Feng Chai. Oh my god, am I back in Southern Jade City? Shang Guan Hong was so embarrassed that he really wanted to dig a hole and crawl into it, but at the same time, he felt burning hate inside of him. The one who had castrated him was Shang Guan Fei but he regarded both of the twins as mortal enemies. Frightened, angry, and puzzled, Queen Ju didn't understand how things like abduction and kidnapping could happen to her. She had never thought that of all the miserable experiences like death, serious illness, and the downfall of her country and home, she would have a humiliating experience like this. They sat in a circle and looked at each other, judging and sizing each other up like kung fu experts who were carefully examining their opponents before a competition. The atmosphere was a little tense. Xu Yang Wei was the only one that could break the ice, so she smiled harder than she had ever done before, saying, I didn't expect to meet anyone I knew in a place like this. Let me introduce you all one by one. This is Xiao Feng Chai, a famous figure in Jade City. She's really remarkable. Many men have spent thousands of tales of silver just to see her. Although Queen Ju grew up in Jade City, she had lived inside a big mansion in northern Jade City and to her, the southern Jade City was as far away as a myth. She had never heard of Xiao Feng Chai's great name and from Xu Yenwei's introduction, she understood that the other side was a prostitute. She immediately felt contempt for her and skimmed over her without even a nod. Xiao Feng Chai snorted in her heart but did not immediately strike back. Looking at Shang Guan Ayu, Xu Yang Wei was a bit at a loss regarding how she should introduce her. She had never imagined that the two would meet one day. Apart from the embarrassment, she wondered how the Dragon King would react if he were here. I'm Shang Guan Ayu, the instructor of the Land of Fragrance, said Shang Guan Ayu of her own initiative. Queen Ju's eyes couldn't move. So this was that legendary queen who had taken back the entire country from the Dragon King's hands but always called herself the instructor. With her head tilted, Xu Yang Wei enjoyed herself despite the unfavorable situation and secretly judged the two similarly aged women as an onlooker. Queen Ju was getting bossier. The timid and shy princess had long disappeared. Now she could remain dignified in the face of adversity as if she was humbling herself to come here and that this was an incognito visit to buy over people. Miss Ayu, who she hadn't seen for a long time, had changed a lot. She appeared much less sad and depressed than when she was at the castle, and her smile was quite graceful and confident, 
somewhat seemingly resembling that of a real queen. It was just that she still possessed the innocence of childhood and looked too young. If I were the Dragon King, before Xu Yenwei's mind could drift away, Queen Ju opened her mouth. The Dragon King often talked to me about you. The Queen's voice was approachable but Xu Yangwei immediately understood that the duel had begun. Queen Ju was lying. Xu Yangwei knew this more clearly than anyone else about how hard it was for the Queen to see the Dragon King even once. Even the ordinary soldiers of the Dragon Army saw the Dragon King more often than her. How could the Dragon King often talk to her? Shang Guan Ayu responded better than Xu Yangwei had thought she would, not showing the slightest emotion. You must be the Queen of the Stone Kingdom. I really didn't expect to see you here. Xiao Fengchai suddenly realized something, wait a minute, all of you are the Dragon King's women. Did his enemies kidnap you? I'm not. Shang Guan Hong spoke up for the first time after entering the tent. He had been standing beside Queen Ju and behaved no differently from a submissive servant. Pooh, they wouldn't have tied you if you hadn't shamelessly insisted on coming. Xu Yang Wei bluntly pointed out the truth. Shang Guan Hong really regretted it. As the queen's close aide, he wanted to show his loyalty at the critical moment but didn't expect that the kidnapping would really succeed and that no one would come to save them. The words women of the Dragon King had a subtle effect on both Queen Ju and Shang Guan Ayu. The two bowed their head and said nothing, but in Xiao Feng Chai's eyes, it was just an intermission before even fiercer moves were revealed next. She had to do something to stop it, so she said to Xiao Feng Chai, that's strange. What do these young and old baldies have to do with the Dragon King? And what's your relationship with the Dragon King? I have nothing to do with the Dragon King, the two said at the same time. One of them was Lian Qing, who had been sitting behind his master as an onlooker, and inwardly sighing about the Dragon King's good fortune in love affairs. We have been imprisoned here for a long time. It was the Khan's order, and it had nothing to do with the Dragon King. Xiao Feng Chai also denied this, saying, there must be a mistake or there are some other reasons. I have nothing to do with the Dragon King at all. Xu Yang Wei pursed his lips. Xiao Feng Chai, we used to be in the same trade and neighbors, so you don't have to hide from me, do you? Can you swear that you've never seduced the Dragon King? Can you swear that you've never done it? Although Xu Yang Wei had long since retired from her old job, she was still a little jealous of Xiao Feng Chai and didn't believe that any man could resist the charm of this woman. Unannoyed, Xiao Feng Chai replied with a straight face. While living in the brothel, it's unavoidable that I seize a chance wherever there is merrymaking. But I swear to the heavens that the Dragon King and I are innocent. He knows who I really love and therefore has always treated me with courtesy. He's a worthy gentleman. Xiao Feng Chai deliberately raised her voice in the hopes that the words would reach the kidnapper's ears. Xu Yang Wei smiled and proudly glanced at Queen Ju and Shang Guan Ayu before she said to Xiao Feng Chai, Well, we all have someone we love. It happens all the time. You don't have to care too much about it. Every man will become picky once they have two beautiful women like these two, let alone the Dragon King. The Dragon King had actually met Xiao Feng Chai before he got married at the Stone Kingdom. Xu Yang Wei didn't care about the loophole in her words as she simply felt that the gap between her and the most popular courtesan of the retention alley wasn't as big as she had thought. Xiao Feng Chai didn't want to argue with Xiao Feng Chai. She smiled and turned to Shang Guan Ayu, that's right. The Dragon King and Miss Ayu were childhood sweethearts. Together, they manged the Kuan society well. The residents of the whole Jade City still remember them. Upon hearing this, Queen Ju abruptly raised her head, trying to say something but paused, though her expression had changed. She turned to Shang Guan Hong and snapped, What are you doing standing around here? Go and ask what's going on and get me a glass of water while you're at it. None of the two tasks was easy to complete but Shang Guan Hong dared not object. He nodded and ran to the monks, 
intending to make up some lies and sneak out later. He knew that the queen just wanted to vent her anger on him but didn't really expect anything. The four women fell silent, and Lianqing wasn't aware of their complicated relationship and the battle of words at all. He could only think of one question. Does the Dragon King only have this few women? It seems a bit too few. Xu Yang Wei immediately said, of course not, there's more, like, she held back the name of Luo Ningcha in time. Lotus. Right, if this is really a kidnapping of the Dragon King's women, she should be the first to be kidnapped. Queen Ju sneered as she revealed, I'm afraid the kidnapper is exactly her. Just then the officer came in and said, one, two, three, for women, come with me. Someone wants to see you. Chapter 650, Brilliant Idea Translator, Henny Translations Editor, Henny Translations It was suffocatingly hot outside, but this man was wearing a thick coat as if he had a bad cold. It seemed like he didn't have many days left to live and couldn't be moved even with four beautiful women standing right before him. The Dragon King's women, he said. Except for a slight movement of his lips, the muscles of his face was as stiff as iron. And he indeed couldn't be moved by the beauties in front of him, his shrill voice and beardless chin had clearly given away his identity. The four women who had been at loggerheads just moments ago exchanged a glance. Being in the same dangerous situation made them put aside their disputes for the time being. Shangguan Ayu stood out and asked, You are a disciple of the Essence Pavilion. The pavilion is gone, and there are no disciples anymore. Shangguan Ayu knew that she was right but what was strange was that this disciple of the Essence Pavilion was alone. His dual cultivator was nowhere to be found, and the one standing behind him as a guard was that disciple of the waning moon hall. Don't you always appear in pairs? Where's your partner? Dead. He became seriously ill as soon as he entered the prairie, but like the others, his death is also on the Dragon King. What does that have to do with the Dragon King? Xu Yang Wei stuck out her head and asked. Hearing that the other side was from the Essence Pavilion, she wasn't that afraid. After all, she had visited them to have her fortune told before. He killed Immortal Peng and broke apart the Essence Pavilion. He's the origin of all tragedies, so he has to accept all the consequences. The stiff-faced man looked low in spirits and said his story that should have been full of hate weakly as if he had been forced to do so. Xu Yang Wei was slightly stunned and didn't understand the connection between the two matters, but she knew one thing for sure. Well, let's say you really hate the Dragon King. So why not just go kill him to avenge yourself? What's all this about capturing a few women who don't even know Kung Fu? The stiff-faced man shook his head. Just killing the Dragon King is not revenge. What goes around must come around, and since he killed the one I love, I'll just return that feeling to him. The Essence Pavilion was located in the City View Alley which was a den of iniquity and even Xu Yang Wei didn't want to ask for more detail. She frowned and said, in that case, please release me first. The Dragon King doesn't love me and I also don't love the Dragon King. Faced with the gaze of the other three women, Xu Yang Wei was bold and straightforward. We have to tell the truth, don't we? I haven't even met the Dragon King that many times, Xiao Feng Chai rushed to say. My man is Meng Mingxu and he lives in the northern Jade City. You must know him. Just let me go, he can afford any amount of money. She carefully concealed the fact that she herself was very rich. Shangguan Ayu and Queen Ju remained silent for a long while and it was Shangguan Ayu who spoke first in the end. I'm the daughter of the Unique King, an enemy of the Dragon King. I'm also the instructor of the Land of Fragrance, a guest invited by the Second Consort. Only Queen Ju continued wearing a cold face with her head held high, neither asking for mercy nor saying anything. Xu Yang Wei sighed inwardly, knowing that the queen would rather die than openly admit that her husband and wife relationship with the Dragon King only existed in name. The stiff-faced man's chest heaved. 
He breathed heavily as if he had been persuaded but when he opened his mouth, he said, it doesn't matter. As long as the Dragon King cares about you, it's enough. Just like the disciples of the Essence Pavilion who've died, they might not care about me but I still will avenge them. Queen Ju grunted and finally spoke up. Where's Lotus? Why didn't you bring her in? She's the one the Dragon King cares about the most. The disciple of the waning moon hall behind the stiff-faced man said, Master Commander hates the Dragon King to the core. The only reason she acts courteously with him is that it's just a disguise. She's actually waiting for the opportunity to avenge herself. The Essence Pavilion has joined the waning moon hall, and what we carry out are the orders of the Master Commander. I don't believe it. Shang Guan Ayu took a step forward as she stated, Lotus would not do such a despicable thing. The facial muscles of the stiff-faced man were like dried bacon even when he smiled. He he, despicable. I like this word. Unfortunately, I can't think of any more despicable means to deal with you so I can only let the monks take advantage of you first. As for the master commander, she has something more important to do and doesn't have time to deal with you herself. But she has given me a list which is actually very helpful. So, forget about her. Your fate is in my hands now. The more Xiao Feng Chai listened, the more confused she became. She had a vague impression of the name Lotus and only knew that she was a female killer and the Dragon King's bodyguard, and that she herself seemed to have never met her before. Wait a moment. Let's get this straight first. I don't know anybody who is called Master Commander or Lotus. Why did you put me in the list? You must be mistaken. The disciple of the waning moon hall snorted, what is done by night appears by day. You tried to seduce the dragon king back in Jade City, do you think no one saw your ugly wriggling in bed? Xiao Feng Chai was dumbfounded. First, she couldn't imagine when such a secret thing had been seen. She actually couldn't control herself after the dragon king had left. Second, she was a prostitute and the fact that she had made those poses after failing to seduce the Dragon King was like being a calligrapher who couldn't show her talent in public and then privately creating her calligraphy works for self-entertainment. How could someone even get jealous of this? Xu Yang Wei curled her lips, thinking of something to say but holding back. Xiao Feng Chai quickly adjusted herself and ignored the eyes of the other three women. Well, now that you have seen it, you should know that the Dragon King never accepted me. He didn't take me seriously at all, let alone care about me. He doesn't care about you. You are still in charge of transferring the money of the Dragon Army, aren't you? That's business. Xiao Feng Chai couldn't understand how anyone in the world could be so unreasonable. She and the Dragon King did have an agreement to help him deliver gold and silver but that had stopped for a year before resuming after the fight at the Xiaoyo Lake. But she had never met the Dragon King in person and the one she had been in touch with had always been Xu Xiaoyi. The stiff-faced man who hadn't spoken for a while interrupted the two's argument, this isn't important either. As long as you are still useful to the Dragon King, that's enough. I want the world to know that the Dragon King can't protect his own women. The conversation ended like this and the four were taken back to the tent. For the first time in her life, Xiao Feng Chai flew into a rage. Not only had she been kidnapped, but she had also failed to put her invincible seduction techniques into good use, except for that trivial officer who kept winking at her. Xu Yang Wei was also very angry because all she had done so far was take care of women for the Dragon King, and she had always been polite to Lotus. She didn't expect that she would also be on the list. Lunatic, she's really a lunatic. It's such a pity I used to be so good to her. Queen Ju was lost into her own thoughts with her head lowered when she suddenly looked up and said to Shangguan Are you, do you think there's a problem, too? Yes. Of course there is. As I said, Lotus has gone crazy. Xu Yang Wei didn't understand the meaning of the two. Xiao Feng Chai suppressed her anger and also came to understand. 
Yeah, it seems unnecessary for the zombie face to call us out and just say something like that. He isn't here just for revenge. There's something he couldn't say under the supervision of the disciple of the waning moon hall. Although Queen Ju was still young, her experience had been greatly enriched in the past several years and she was now very good at reading people's faces. But she still looked at Shangguan Ayu instead of Xiao Feng Chai when she spoke. Xiao Feng Chai patted her chest and let out a long breath. It's okay, but what does he want? If he wants sex, I can make a sacrifice for everyone once. If he wants money, then I'll have no choice but rely on you, Xiao Feng Chai. He's a eunuch, how can he have sex? And I don't think he loves money either. Those disciples of the Essence Pavilion are all weirdos, and the things he wants must be also very weird. Xiao Feng Chai looked around and lowered her voice. He'll come to us again whenever he wants, so don't worry about it. These monks are the ones we actually have to be careful of. The monks looked quite honest sitting on the futon and doing meditation with their eyes closed. Once in a while, someone would open their eyes but immediately closed them again. Xu Yang Wei was very clear about what was hidden in the flashing eyes and couldn't help but become a bit worried. Honestly, I can take on two or three monks but there are so many of them here, you'd better not push me into the pit of fire alone. No one will push you. Xiao Feng Chai turned to Feiyan and said in an admirable tone, with this head monk, we won't be in danger. Can you recite the sutra you did before? Wouldn't it be better to take precautions? Feiyan shook his head. The result will only grow worse and worse. Some people may sever their evil thoughts from now on but some may also backfire. The essay of severing obsession will destroy the last bit of virtue they had ever cultivated. So it's better to not use it if there's any other way. Feiyan was answering Xiao Feng Chai's question but Shang Guan Ayu felt that he was talking to her. Lian Qing leaped to his feet and said in a loud voice, I'll protect you. I'll knock out the teeth of anyone who dares come near you. The threat was so powerful that several monks who frequently opened their eyes dared not to peep again. But Xiao Feng Chai, who had seen this robber monk poor self-control, didn't trust his words much and contemptuously said, what if you lose your reasoning first? Who's gonna knock your teeth out then? Lian Qing blushed and rebutted, I won't eat or drink so they won't have any way of tricking me again. Xiao Feng Chai didn't trust him much but Xu Yang Wei winked at her to signal her not to offend the backer who had voluntarily promised to protect them. Queen Ju hadn't experienced danger and didn't have any experience of observing men like Xu Yang Wei did, so she was the least afraid of the four women. She beckoned Shang Guan Hong to come over and said, Do the monks know who I am? Yes, I already told them. Shang Guan Hong respectfully replied, Go tell them again that when I return to my country I'll build the largest temple in all of Xiaoyao Lake and they will be welcome to join it. I'll make offerings to them and also leave the position of the head monk to them. Shang Guan Hong followed the order to pass the message. Queen Zhu loftily looked around to show that the problem had been solved. Xiao Feng Chai smiled. That's what a queen does. You are so rich that we commoners just can't compete but a temple may not be enough. These monks are all like hungry wolves after taking the aphrodisiac. I'm afraid that they are not interested in the offerings. Your Highness, you might as well promise them a brothel. Queen Ju's expression changed slightly. She turned around her head, still refusing to speak to Xiao Feng Chai directly. Shang Guan Ayu didn't join their conversation but had something in her mind that she had to say. Sitting on her heels while opposite Feiyan, she asked, You are very good at Kung Fu and also have the will to help others. Why are you willing to stay in prison and watch the enemy strike? Feiyan's smile seemed to have never moved and his eyes seemed to be able to pierce into a person's heart. Aren't you willing to stay in the prison and wait for a miracle to happen, too? Shang Guan Ayu's heart trembled and all the words in her mind turned to dust. For her. The prison was not this tent, but rather the whole world. 
Xu Yang Wei didn't understand what the two were talking about. Seeing Shang Guan Yu's face change slightly, she couldn't help but sympathize with her and walked over, saying, What prison? Such a broken place can't imprison Miss Ayu at all. Monk, if you are really capable, just help Miss Ayu restore her power so that she can fly out like a bird and call for the Dragon King and her female soldiers to get us all out. Xiao Fengchai just said it casually but Queen Ju and Xiao Fengchai cried out brilliant idea in a low voice at the same time. Then the two of them exchanged a glance, all surprised by this coincidental tacit understanding.